for uh, just uh, half a minute to pay our homage to our madam thank you thank you please dear friends today we have here with us one of the most renowned person in public health well renowned person dr soumya samidadan formerly she was the chief scientist of who i think everybody must be knowing here and uh, as i mentioned she has come here to deliver a narration on public health in 2021 21st century and that is organized by the alumni association with the help of the family of madam beloved man and uh, maybe the youngsters may not be knowing chitra madam well when we i joined mbbs in 1970s madam was the initially the one or two days uh, uh, two years uh, dr joseph sir was the professor thereafter chitra madam took over as the head of preventive medicine at that time the community medicine was called preventive medicine and uh, in her late years i had the opportunity to regularly visit her because she was staying in ambalamuk i was working in the swandana hospital just near the her house and also i was staying we used to along with my wife ani we used to visit her regularly and also for the regular medical checkups and everything i used to because she was having some difficulty in walking so every week i used to visit her and uh, so uh, that was the relationship with madam and uh, my family and you, actually i would say she is one of the noblest ladies not because she is my teacher she is one of the noblest ladies i have ever seen she is very soft spoken loving and uh, if we talk to her actually uh, we will not be able to even get out because so loving the talking is so that was the our madam i evening there was a dinner i mentioned the madam's photo is in still in my bedroom it is there as my one of my teacher and uh, so and uh, it is uh, actually this idea of uh, celebrate thing or observing the birth centenary of madam this is 100 years it is not exactly this date a uh, slight difference is, has come from the two sons of madam sri mohan gobal and uh, bala gobal both were renowned personalities and uh, and uh, uh, mr mohan gobal mohan gobal ah he said and ba- bala gobal and uh, hello we had a meeting together with the mb prasar and that was the occasion we decided to and, uh, it, and indeed we are extremely fortunate to have dr soumya samidadan to deliver this oration so actually again yesterday evening we had a chat with the madam and i was really surprised to know her uh, level of knowledge and interest in the public health, not only in the public health, in the social development also. She, was a, she just said a few words, 10 minutes, and she has given us a lot of information just in 5 to 10 minutes. And it is, I, actually, I am not surprised that she has gone to that level of being the chief scientist of WHO. And we, we are extremely honored, madam, we have with your presence and uh, we will uh, take this opportunity to welcome on behalf of the Toronto Medical College our principal is there our uh, dm is there our secretary is here and uh, also on behalf of the alumni association and the students and faculty of uh, Toronto Medical College 
then we have our uh, vice chancellor dr mohanan kunnumel and uh, for uh, actually even though he is a part of the alumni association he has a special place in his heart for this alma mater that i definitely know and for every activities of the alumni association he is an advisor he is uh, always with us and uh, let me welcome dr mohan gunmay to this session then we have our health health secretary the young health secretary very uh, uh, enterprising and actually uh, in that she i think you joined only a few months back in the last less than one year she has established her uh, position as a, one of the best health secretaries and a lot of programs are going on in the health sector in kerala and the changes are happening and uh, she is the most important brain behind all this we know that and uh, we welcome dr tingu besal ms tingu besal to this occasion thank you then we have our uh, principal and uh, director of medical education uh, 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 also our uh, director of regional cancer center uh, and uh, yes and uh, then uh, we have our past presidents uh, dr vijayaravan sir dr martan rola sir dr saudula sir and uh, then the alp medical college principal dr suma tk i think and also lot of uh, uh, yes dr taha the CEO of the PMS Dental College and uh, uh, then our former principal Harriet and Dr. Harriet and sir all are here and I don't want to name all of you. Yes. Uh, of course, our Iqbal sir, Dr. Iqbal sir, he is actually going to mo- uh, uh, moderate the second session and all the senior faculties and the senior doctors, my friends and uh, Uh, students of public health from different medical colleges are here i let me welcome all of you just one thing after the oration we have another i think the uh, program means uh, there is a session on a kerala health model ahead which is moderated by dr ibal sir and uh, it will be inaugurated that session will be inaugurated by our vice chancellor dr mohan kunnumel and uh, along with that actually this is the we are starting launching a master class series from the trivandrum medical college because we know a lot of mis yesterday madam also mentioned lot of misinformations on the health are there in the uh, uh, social media even sometimes in the print also so we want to because uh, a lot of actually even from toronto medical college there are more than 1000 doctors in the national health service and maybe double in usa also so uh, they are all in the top position uh, again the teachers here are one of the best in the world but the thing is the public is not aware what is happening in instead here and also we want to uh, give a message of the true scientific health and uh, that is why we are planning for a uh, starting this uh, series of master class series and uh, that also will be inaugurated and followed by there will be a, a this uh, discussion on a kerala health model and the participant of course is dr saumya samidanathan then uh, i think dr sujatha rao former union health secretary also is joining from uh, delhi and dr tingu bisal is there dr thomas matthew director of medical education then dr mp pille and uh, dr rv achogan our uh, national president of ima elect and dr ss lal he is a everybody knows him he is also a internationally renowned public health specialist so they are all joining and uh, discussing the future of kerala health model also and uh, this is the program and i with this i welcome once again all of you all the media people here and uh, i request uh, the actually this is this program is uh, not only with the alumni association but we have a founder foundation called dr vc mathuroy academy 
of which Dr. Vinay Kumar, our former Vice Dean and Gastroenterology Professor, is the chairman. And uh, uh, I request uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar to come to the stage and uh, start the proceedings, take over the proceedings and uh, start the oration. Thank you. Always. I also invite Dr. Anuja, Head of Department of the Community Medicine Toronto Medical College to chair the session. Please come to the stage. Dear friends, we begin the prestigious Professor Chitra Gobalan oration for which Along with my co-chair, let us welcome our chief guest, Professor Soumya Swaminathan. Respected teachers and my dear colleagues. Actually, I am so privileged to be here with my teachers. Most of the faces I see are my teachers. And why I am here is because of the guidance and classes and leadership I got from you all people. Now, today I am privileged to uh, be here as one of the guests. I am actually representing a person who is actually uh, assigned to say a few words about uh, my f uh, one of my former HODs. She is actually the fourth HOD of Community Medicine Department. Previously, it was known as the Social and Preventive Medicine Department. A uh, very strong administrator and a strong academician uh, that uh, the department ever faced. That is what I uh, learned from uh, my teachers because. I was actually born on the year when she became HOD in this community medicine department. So I learned all these things from my, my teachers. So she is, uh, she is actually, we are actually following the path of teachers, my, our teachers. And what we are actually doing now is actually based on the guidance given by them and following their, uh, their footsteps and we are actually planning to uh, uh, go forward to do what the what the system expects this few words madam so Swami, madam i am inviting madam to speak yeah, sorry okay 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 thank you thank you yeah. uh, let me now welcome professor vijay raghun sir the former hod of uh, cardiology of Toronto medical college or uh, the teacher of the teachers to pay tribute to Madam, Professor Chitra Gopalan. Distinguished guests of the evening, Dr. Saumya Swaminathan, and a host of others here. Everyone you can think of at the, at the helm of healthcare in Kerala are here. Host of others here. And I also join with John Pernicker in welcoming every one of you. The Dr. Chitra Gobal and I put a picture here. I don't know, first, first picture, first picture. Yeah, that's right. In the 1950s, the beauty with the rains. This term was used by one of her contemporaries who later became 
professor of cardiology at the Madras Medical College, Dr. P. K. Krishnan Kutti. She was one of the prettiest girls in the medical school at the time. And that's why beauty with brains. By the time I joined medical school in 1960, she was, she was just coming back from USA. And she was such a role model to all medical teachers. And she taught me preventive medicine, a subject which never liked by the medical students. But this was an exception. This was an exception. She comes to the class and she made all of us interested in social and preventive medicine. That's the name of the department at the time. In 1963, I remember, she took us for an educational tour. And a lot of areas which I never knew existed in Madras, like the BCG factory in Gindi, the Kilpak Waterworks, and more than anything else, she took us to the infectious disease hospital. For the first and last time, I saw the hemorrhagic smallpox. Everybody dies with hemorrhagic smallpox. But whomsoever want to go and see hemorrhagic smallpox were separate off in a room and we were given additional smallpox vaccination on that day itself. We all escaped developing smallpox. What she did was taking all of us from bedside to the bench, the reverse of what we may call in medicine, from the bedside to the bench and showed us how social and preventive medicine could be practiced. The practical aspect of it, she has shown me where the vaccine is made, where the infectious disease is to be treated and, and at its worst form of form of hemorrhagic smallpox. She was a master teacher. This was appreciated by the World Health Organization. She continued to give lectures at Singapore for the WHO for many years after the retirement. And I still remember many years she used to come to me and say, Vijayaragavan, am I fit to travel and come back? And she, the, the speciality of his, that, that she made many of us practice preventive medicine. I did a work on prevalence of ischemic heart disease in Kerala. We showed that this is not a disease of the affluent society of Kerala. Kerala was unique that when we pulled the data from the private and the government hospitals, as many patients from the lower income group were there with acute heart attack as from the higher income group. The disease, the disease is prevalent among the poor people of Kerala. This was actually commented upon way back in 1962 in circulation by our esteemed Professor Sri S. Padmavati. During her earlier years, earlier years, she was sensitized before she came to medical school, before she came to Toronto Medical College. She was sensitized on the need for or the ignorance about the common man about the detection of problems during the prenatal period. Detection of prenatal period. She was sad that many of the young mothers were dying. And she organized the midwifery training for the antenatal, midwifery training and antenatal care for young women. And this was the beginning of Kerala's reduction of maternal mortality and infant mortality. Today we proudly say that we stand number one in, 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 in India in maternal mortality and fetal mortality. This was the beginning of such an effort to teach the young girls how to examine the pregnant women and identify their problems and if there are problems, how to get ideal treatment 
and prevent maternal death. This care grew into a much bigger organization as we did in Kims. We established by 2005 a department of perinatology for high risk pregnancy. More than that, obstetricians were sensitized on the need for this and there began the work of Dr. Piley who looked at it, why mothers die? Why mothers die? And Dr. Piley and his group, I belong, I, I am part of a group looking after the cardiovascular problems of pregnancy by which pe people died. And we found it's a pitiful state of affairs. Many of the maternal mortality occurs in girls between 25 and 35. Preventable of, preventable of. The why mothers die has sensitized every obstetrician in Kerala to look for how to prevent maternal deaths and maintain the low maternal mortality of Kerala. See the, I remember uh, the Chatra Govan as, 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 a, as teaching all of us. There's one more picture of, of Chitra Gopal and po taking postgraduate. Next, next picture, can you put? Yeah, that's right. Postgraduation from the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Johns Hopkins Medical School. She later became my, my patient and my wife became her counts counselor because both of them belonged to Madras and they used to chat in Tamil and because they enjoyed the politics of Tamil Nadu as well as the global politics. And she used to advise her, don't have such accent language because you are touching on a lot of sensitive topics. On this birth century of Professor Chitra Gopalan, we humbly pay tributes to Professor Chitra Gopalan and I'm thankful to the organizers for requesting me to pay tribute to my beloved teacher. My thanks are also due to your sons, Mr. Bala Gopal and Mr. Mohan Gopal and other relatives for arranging this program with the Alumni Association of Toronto Medical College. May her soul rest in peace. Thank you. During the period when I did clinical work, during the period when I did clinical work, I was seeing cases coming into the hospital. Young girls, teenagers, all being brought in in pools of blood because they were not attended by trained midwives. They were all and attended by untrained what they called barber midwives, who, who had no idea of what sanitation was, who had no idea of what normal delivery was. Fortunately for me, a project came into being and the project took shape in Kerala state. When I asked Achin, he said, ask, Achin means not my father-in-law, my husband. Asked him and he said, if that will be of great service to uh, mothers and children and if it's going to save the life of so many you can certainly take it up so I volunteered to take up that post and worked as national counterpart to the team leader of the WHO international team WHO UNICEF WHO team aided by UNICEF UNICEF gave us lots of vehicles um, midwifery kits light aluminium kits full of sterilized equipment which the midwife could carry with her when she goes for home delivery. Now, these things have to be handed over to women who are trained. So, I recruited women from all over the state, established schools of midwifery, 
there were no schools of midwifery at all. There was no trained midwife in the state. But from that, by the time I gave up that job, there were more than 650 trained midwives and there were 10 schools of midwifery established in the state. Not only did we have to select and train and uh, um, establish schools of midwifery and train all these girls, we had to find suitable accommodation for them because it's not easy to live in a rural area uh, where this young girl is posted alone. So I went to every panjayat, spoke to the panjayat members and panjayat president and had them donate a building or gives a building on small rent close to a family uh, group there and made the family also responsible for the security and welfare of the midwife and arranged for a young boy or young girl to accompany her if she's on call at night. And if she had any problem, we saw to it that she was taken to the nearest telephone booth and made to call the primary health center from where a van would come and she could take the patient in that van either to the primary health center or if it's a more complicated to the nearest taluk or district hospital. So MCH care was properized during the period of time and the maternal death rate went down considerably during that period of time and so did infant mortality. When I came back from Johns Hopkins, I found that my lien had been transferred from the Health Services Department to the Medical College to Vandram, which was newly established here. Then, of course, I liked teaching as well. I used to take every opportunity to talk to the doctors who were working in the MCH program, and I enjoyed talking to them and interacting with, with them. And so I knew I would have no difficulty even if I went to the Medical College. And as my children were growing up, I thought maybe this uh, shift would be good. Started as assistant professor, became associate professor, and then last professor and head of the department of community medicine. It started as social and preventive medicine. Ultimately, it was called community medicine because it's not only social medicine for prevention of disease, but comprehensive health care that we were offering to the community. is a household name in Gutanad from where I, I come, come from. Not only just because, you know, he has got his ancestral roots there, but also because he has prepared a development package for Gutanad, knowing the pulse of the peculiar geography and ecology. And we in Gutanad believe that that is the only solution to take Gutanad forward. So I have great pressure to welcome Dr. Saumya Swaminathan, the, the Dr. Swaminathan Jr. as the illustrious daughter of the illustrious father with her roots next to us. So to more formally introduce Dr. Saumya Swaminathan. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan was the most uh, recently WHO's chief scientist and before that Deputy Director General for Programs, as WHO's inaugural Chief Scientist, as is already mentioned by Panikarji, Dr. Swaminathan built the Science Division with a focus on research, quality assurance of norms and standards, and digital health. She played a key role during the pandemic in coordinating the scientific efforts at WHO. We also know about that you know, from our purpose and media. As well as setting up COVAX, with a focus on equitable vaccine distribution to limited and middle-income countries. She from uh, India, she trained first in India, and a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. She, she brings with her 30 years of experience in clinical care and research, and worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programs. Dr. Swaminathan was secretary to Government of India for Health and Research and the Director of uh, ICMR, 
from 2015 to 2017. From 29 to 2011, she also served as the coordinator of the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases, Geneva. She received her academic training in India, as I already mentioned to you, and also in UK and the United States of America. And she has published more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She's a fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine, the Academy of Medical Sciences of uh, UK, and uh, a fellow of nearly all the scientific academies in India. So she, uh, and she serves on several national and global advisory bodies and committees, and is an adjunct professor at Karolinska Institute of Sweden and Tufts University, Boston, USA. So we are extremely privileged, ladies and gentlemen, to have this uh, esteemed uh, personality to uh, d deliver the prestigious Chitra Govalan oration. Madam, well, we invite you. Respected dignitaries uh, on and, and off the dais, and uh, particularly family members of uh, Dr. Chitra Gopal, Mr. Bala Gopal, Mr. Mohan Gopal, and, uh, and other family members. Um, it's uh, indeed an honor and a privilege uh, you know, to stand before you all today uh, when we are recognizing and remembering uh, the life of such an inspirational uh, woman um, and we saw from that video, you know, the passion and the commitment with which Dr. Chitra lived her life and the example that she gave of, uh, you know, noticing a problem of these young women who were coming in and, and dying unnecessarily because they didn't have the access to proper uh, midwifery services during their delivery time and how she went about solving that problem, I think, is a great example for each and every one of us, but particularly for the young people today, because very often when we see a problem, we tend to either not go deeper into it or quite often to believe that the problem is too large and too huge to be solved. And this, of course, is a challenge in a country like India, where everything, you know, you have to multiply by 1.4 billion people. So any challenge always becomes a very large one. But at the same time, I think examples like this and from the lives of other people who have lived here in, you know, in India and have solved some of our major challenges that we faced, whether it was food security or whether it was uh, issues of uh, high maternal mortality, that when there is one person who wants to make a difference, it can actually happen. And I think it was Margaret Mead who said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing that, um, you know, it doesn't need a huge crowd of people to change something in the world. In fact, most things that change in the world are usually because there is a small group of people who are committed to the cause and uh, who keep on at it till something is changed. So we can think of many examples, I think, uh, in my own uh, 40 years of uh, 1982 is when I entered my MD at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and one of the most frequent admissions we would have on the ward was neonatal tetanus. It's the most horrible thing to see um, and uh, Dr. MKC and others, uh, pediatricians, uh, senior ones would have seen it. Luckily, 
none of the juniors, uh, none of you have seen neonatal tetanus, but from the other end of the ward as the mother and baby, and they used to come from all over North India to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, traveling for hundreds of kilometers with this small baby, six, seven days old, because of the practice of applying cow dung onto the umbilical cord. And you could see from a distance that uh, from the facial expression, you could diagnose neonatal tetanus. You didn't even need to do any more investigations. And it was a very high fatality disease. So um, to think that within 20, 25 years, actually, India eliminated neonatal tetanus. All of us have seen poliomyelitis. We all have relatives, probably, who have poliomyelitis. We have uh, eliminated that. Uh, of course, globally, we have only one disease that got eradicated, that is smallpox. And we heard from Dr. Vijay Raghavan also, uh, who gave an amazing tribute to Dr. Chitra Gopal, that you know we could understand much better her personality, her commitment to teaching. And uh, the way she went about it was actually uh, learning by seeing and learning by doing, rather than sitting in lecture halls, uh, listening to lectures. So I think there is nothing to replace that um, really. So in fact, that's one of the things I try to do when I travel somewhere is to uh, always visit uh, the community and talk to the community because in my career I have realized that some of the insights that you get from the community you cannot get from anywhere else or from any book. And of course, I've spent most of my career doing research on tuberculosis and HIV. And even the way that um, I got into HIV was because uh, I worked in the tuberculosis research center in Chennai. And it was very obvious that uh, TB was actually the, the one infection that was killing most of the HIV infected people in India, but also in, in sub-Saharan Africa, that there was need for a lot more research on how to diagnose, how to prevent, how to treat HIV-associated TB. And remember, this was before antiretroviral treatment. And there was so much of fear and stigma associated with the disease that very few, even very few doctors and health professionals actually wanted to deal with people who had HIV infection because it was a fatal illness. With uh, Sooner or later, you were going to progress and die. And so naturally, as human beings, everybody has that fear. So I remember our, uh, at that time, my uh, boss, the director general of the ICMR had come to Chennai and he said to me, you should start work on HIV and TB. And I said, I'm, I'll be happy to do that. We already have an AIDS research institute in Pune. Will there be some confusion? And he said, no, there's enough work to be done. You focus on TB, HIV. Nobody in India is working on that right now. So I think that was the best uh, advice I had in my career because uh, it was a new area, it was challenging. So I went around asking, we have about 500 staff in the institute, who's going to join me in this new program that we're setting up? There were exactly five people who were willing to work with me, uh, again, because it was HIV. And in fact, we were really looked upon as a little outlier team. People used to look at us a little bit differently. And you know, we were always asked to be washing our hands when we came back from the hospital. And at that time, Dr. Devanayagam was in Thambaram Hospital. And Thambaram became very famous. It's a, it was a sanatorium originally set up by the British for TB. And then it continued as a chest and thoracic diseases hospital. There used to be thoracic surgeries performed there. But Dr. Devanayagam, again, an FRCCP trained, uh, uh, very nationalistic, patriotic uh, physician and an excellent teacher, was at that time the superintendent. And he said, I will take and care of all HIV infected people. So the whole of South India actually, we used to have people pouring into that sanatorium and it became an HIV hospital, but in a way it was a real learning ground for many um, generations of doctors because it was not something anybody had seen before. But then I also saw the, the social side of, uh, of disease and uh, as, again, reminded by Dr. Chitra Gopal's, uh, uh, the way she described her approach, not only just training midwives and then expecting them to do their work, but actually looking at the social circumstances in which these girls had to work and, and ensuring that they were taken care of so that they could perform their services, going to the panchayats, talking to the panchayat leaders. So we had to do a lot of that because we found that these people who, um, young, 
men and women, because most of them were in their 20s and 30s, and uh, in some the disease would progress faster than in others, but invariably the story was the man would be infected first, uh, and, and of course, as you know, truck drivers were, in the beginning was a, a group that was highly impacted by this epidemic, but there were other professions as well, would infect his wife and, and sometimes, you know, maternal to child transmission, the children would be also born with HIV, and the man would progress and die first, and then the women and children were left usually uh, without any social support because they were thrown out of their homes in most cases. So we had to deal with the social and the legal and all of these other aspects, psychological trauma. And I can never forget uh, a patient saying to me, you know, he was dying. It was very clear that, that he was dying and we would go on morning rounds and I would um, make sure that we talk to every patient. Uh, and so I went to his bedside and I was holding his hand and, you know, talking to him. And he said, um, uh, you know, I don't, I know that you've done everything possible for me and there's nothing more that you can do. You've taken very good care. Your team has, you know, taken care of me. And it was actually a bit sad because it, the patients that we took care of, the research group, were actually much, much better taken care of than the other patients in the ward because in a busy hospital with hundreds of patients, you know how it is in a, in a, in a general ward. But these research patients, we would, you know, so they did, they, they were more privileged compared to the others, but still they were dying. And so he said, the fact that you come and you hold my hand and talk to me is more than make, makes up for the fact that you cannot treat me or, or cure me. You know, because the stigma is more of a killer than, than the actual medical process that was going on. And so these um, lessons that I learned from uh, patients with uh, tuberculosis, you know, who come from the poorest sections of society and um, who are very often facing so many challenges in their life. And as doctors, sometimes you're sitting in the clinic and advising people, do this, do that, eat this, eat that, don't, you know, take rest or don't smoke and um, and then you visited, we used to do home visits because very often these TB patients would not come for treatment and so we would go home to find out and then you see the actual situation, how that patient is, is living and how the family is coping and then you have a very different approach um, to, to dealing with this. So I think I very much relate to what was said about Dr. Chitra and also what we saw in her, uh, in her video clip and I hope that uh, element of empathy and compassion that is part of the medical profession uh, and public health uh, should stay because with more and more automation coming, more and more uh, computers and, and databases, sometimes there's a tendency for us to maybe drift away uh, and so nothing can replace the human touch in the medical profession. So I think that in the health profession as a whole, I wouldn't say that, in fact, nurses are much closer to patients than doctors are. And I personally have learned a lot from the nurses that I worked with. Um, the, the other lesson that from that uh, time, early time of working with HIV, which I saw again repeated during the COVID pandemic, was of course um, the issues of uh, equity and uh, um, social justice to some extent. Equity because um, once antiretrovirals were developed and had become available in the, in the Western countries, high income countries, by the late uh, 1990s, um, but were not yet available in, in the most of developing world, patients used to ask that question as to why they could not get the drugs. If drugs had been discovered and were available, in some part of the world, why is it that they were not available here to them? And wasn't their life, you know, equally valuable as the life of somebody? And we had no answer to that, to that question. So when I saw that being repeated again during the pandemic, where uh, it was mentioned about COVAX, COVAX was the initiative that we set up essentially to address the issue of global inequity because we had predicted that this could happen, that vaccines may be developed. We didn't know that whether we would have successful vaccines or not. There are many viral diseases for which there are no vaccines. And so when COVID hit, it was 
anybody's guess whether a vaccine would be developed, but of course there was huge amount of effort made. And we were lucky to have not one or two, but dozens of safe and effective vaccines. But we knew that in the beginning that there would be shortage of vaccines because no company would be able to make billions of doses overnight. And so we had gone through a process of um, what we called an equitable allocation framework where we said, okay, if you have a limited uh, supply, how would you distribute it around the world to protect the maximum number of people and save the most lives? And it was clear by then that the people who were uh, at risk were the older people, people who have underlying comorbidities, and of course, frontline workers, health workers who were uh, already dying by then, and it was clear that they were at very high risk. So if you took only these categories of people, it comes to something like 10%, not more than 10% of uh, an average country's population. In a high-income country, yes, older people are a slightly higher number. But overall, if you take an average globally, we could have, if we had distributed the vaccines uh, that we had equitably, not equally, but equitably, and there is a difference between equality and equity that uh, sometimes is, is not clear. The example I like to give is uh, if there is a tree with the apples growing on it, right, and you have a number of children of different heights standing under that apple tree trying to pluck apples. If you put everybody on a, on a stool of the same height, right, that's equality. You're giving everybody exactly the same additional help. And so they all stand on that stool. The taller children get taller. The shorter children will still not be able to reach the apple tree. So the taller ones get the advantage and they can take the, the apples. Equity is if you give stools of different heights to the different uh, children and you give the shorter children a higher stool, and then everybody has an equal chance of plucking the apples. So that is a difference between equality and equity. And equity means that you have to address the ones that are the worse off. And I think it's very important for us when we talk about public health today, particularly in a state like Kerala, which is extremely advanced in its uh, health care. Um, and we heard you know, the fantastic, uh, if you look at the indicators and in maternal and child mortality and so on, uh, unbeatable record, the issues of equity and social justice actually become much more important because even in the most advanced countries, the most high income countries of the world, which have all the technologies and everything available to them, we saw that the people most impacted and the highest death rates were among those who were at the bottom of the socioeconomic uh, pyramid and you saw the African Americans having two to three times higher risk of infection and death in the UK you saw that it was the Asian immigrant community that was uh, impacted much more and you know nobody could really explain but there were a variety of factors which related both to their uh, poverty and, and the housing and the, the large families they lived in to the occupations occupations where they could not isolate at home some people were privileged they could work from home these people had to go to work. They were mostly frontline workers, and therefore they were exposed more, infected more. And then they also had underlying comorbidities, more rate, higher rates of obesity, for example, amongst the African Americans than among white Americans, and so on. So I think in every country, this these uh, uh, exist already. These, and if you look at our own NFHS data and analyze by uh, socioeconomic status or by caste status, you'll find that the SC and ST communities have several percentage points lower indicators in any indicator you take, whether it's infant mortality or whether it's nutrition or anemia or anything related to education. So, so we have to address that. And um, so coming back to the, the COVID situation and COVAX, we well, I would say partially successful because what happened is that people, the countries who had the resources had pre-booked um, at risk. They had already placed orders with many different vaccine companies because nobody knew which company was going to succeed. And so they had put billions of dollars already into blocking the first doses of the vaccine coming out. And so those countries had access to many different vaccines 
countries like India and China, which have their own manufacturing capacity, had also access to vaccines. But all the other countries that either didn't have the resources or didn't have manufacturing capacity, like, for example, the, the entire continent of Africa was dependent really on COVAX um, for access to vaccines. And I still remember those days uh, in uh, mid-2021 when, uh, of course, the first vaccines were rolled out in December 2020, if you remember. And by early 21, many countries had started their vaccination programs. COVAX was also depending on Indian manufacturers like the Serum Institute to provide vaccines. And of course, India needed also the vaccines at the same time. So the lesson from all of that was that health is too important to uh, be addressed through donations or through philanthropy alone. And that countries, of course, then the African Union decided that they cannot be in this situation anymore. So they actually got together, the Africa CDC, which was a new organization, then developed their plan. And now they have a roadmap for how they are going to develop um, their own health technologies. So when I witnessed that, I found that the solution was not to keep on criticizing the high income countries, because you can keep doing that, but it's not going to change anything. And of course, we were doing that as WHO, but to really do something very practical. And that's how we started the mRNA technology transfer program, where we said, here's a new technology, very successful, but it's in the hands of only few top multinational companies, which were refusing to share that technology. If you remember, there was India and South Africa had gone to the World Trade Organization early in 2020 and said there should be a waiver of the TRIPS. The IP waiver should be brought in so that any diagnostic or treatment or vaccines developed for COVID must be made open access. And of course, it was blocked at the WTO by the same countries where these big companies are hosted. And so we decided that we need another model. And that model is of open science where basically scientists are given the tools, the knowledge, because a lot of knowledge is now available um, in, uh, on the, uh, in the public domain, and you can use that to create um, the same products. Um, so we called it democratization, really, of knowledge, and we asked countries to put in applications. We received a lot, but South Africa was then selected as the hub for this mRNA tech transfer program. And I'm really happy today, today to see that not only did they, were they able to create a mRNA vaccine from scratch, it was basically the same Moderna vaccine, but they did it from scratch without any help from Moderna. Uh, but now there's a network of 16 centers, um, 16 countries that are part of this mRNA tech transfer program, where I hope what we will see in the future is collaboration in research, in manufacturing, so that not only COVID vaccines, because actually there's no need now to make more COVID vaccines, so that product is being developed more as a proof of principle that it can be done. But diseases like dengue, diseases like tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, for which we still need vaccines, chikungunya, you know, there are any number of infections for which we don't have good vaccines needs to be, uh, uh, can be developed by this network. And the best part is that if you can develop a prototype vaccine for a number of families of viruses, there are uh, about 25 or 27 families of viruses that can potentially cause epidemics and pandemics. So I think for India also, we need a similar roadmap, like what we developed for the world and what we developed for Africa, a roadmap where we look at our public health challenges and uh, or, or let's say the important infectious diseases that we have. But the good thing about mRNA technology is not just for infectious diseases, not only for vaccines, but you can use it to make monoclonal antibodies for cancer and so on. And India has the capacity to do it affordably. So to go back to HIV, it was Yusuf Hamid in Sipla who took on this challenge of making affordable antiretroviral treatments. And because of, I would say that, you know, because of him, 
and people like him in India that today there are 35 or 36 million people around the world on antiretroviral treatment. He brought the price down from, you know, at that time $10,000 a year is what the big companies were selling it for and he brought it to $1 a day and it's even cheaper now and of course there are much better combinations. But, uh, but he did it before the IP rules changed in 2005. It's much more difficult today for Indian companies to break that type of IP and patent. So this is what we see in TB today, Bedaquilin. J&J had filed for extension of their patent, which was expiring this year. Bedaquilin is a drug that's used for MDR-TB treatment. Two young TB, MDR-TB survivors, one of them from India, one from South Africa, went to the court in India and the court threw out the application of J&J so that now Bedaquilin will, the patent will expire later this year and Indian companies and any other companies will be able to make it. So the lesson around all this is that sometimes as medical people we think that these health products, vaccines, drugs which are life-saving should be public goods but the current model of R&D which is driven by profits um, in, in the most instances um, looks at these health products very differently. So I think being self-sufficient is important and India of course is in a position to help other countries as well because the expertise we have. But again for ourselves I think we need to think about cancer treatment, treatment for rare diseases, things for which so far we have not done a lot of innovation. Uh, a lot of the innovation has been happening somewhere else and then we are able to make that product at a lower cost. We need to be doing more innovation and we need to be doing it in the areas which are affecting our populations. Diabetes, hypertension, cancer, dementia, these are all going to increase um, you know, in the future and we cannot rely on, um, on imported technologies. Similarly, assistive devices which every older person needs and I think Kerala is one of the states which is already uh, you know, having a very high life expectancy, many more older people, this is going to, this is a good thing, but it can only be a good thing if those people live a good quality of life. And so I think thinking about what older people are going to need in terms uh, of health technologies, of course, like assistive devices, and again, there's a lot of innovation in India today where affordable devices, whether they are hearing aids, even spectacles, and um, you know wheelchairs and, and walking sticks and so on. Uh, there's a huge global need actually, unmet need. And so India can, can uh, I think, fill that gap, not only for our own population, but there's a big uh, um, demand out there as well. Um, the talk is, is about public health, but I was, uh, you know, had re maybe digressed a little bit uh, into some of the lessons from the pandemic, but clearly the lessons that we learned by looking globally at the response to the pandemic was that those countries which had invested in public health and primary health care in particular did the best in terms of the lowest amount of infection and the lowest amount of death. And they were not necessarily the high income countries, but these were countries like Thailand, like Vietnam, like Rwanda, like Senegal, of course, Bhutan in our own region, where they firstly recognized the problem early on. They had a strong public health uh, cadre and they listened to the advice of the public health people. And the most important was that they had primary health care with involvement of communities. And that community engagement and the trust which the health system had built with the community proved to be the key element of uh, you know, because you needed behavior change, right, as a response in this pandemic. Early on, you needed the social distancing, the masking, and those kind of things, which were all very new and difficult for people uh, to follow. And later on, of course, you needed people to take their vaccines. All of that is behavior. And if you have a trusted relationship with the, between the health system and the community, it clearly was a much... Uh, more effective and studies have shown that those countries where there was high level of trust between people in the community as well as trust between people and governments, those countries 
and the Scandinavian countries actually stood out, had the lowest infections as well as the lowest mortality per capita, per, you know, 100 people. So two big things, investing in science and, and research and investing in public health, which is often very difficult to do politically because public health functions are always behind the scenes. They are invisible. And to convince politicians to put, invest into that, into those functions, requires a lot of uh, clarity, a lot of persuasion, and, um, and a good plan uh, to, to, to take forward. But I think, luckily, maybe the silver lining from the pandemic is the recognition by the world at large, one about you know, the manufacturing, the R&D. So countries in Africa today know that they need to plan to become self-reliant. If not every country, then at least at a regional level, they will, they will make that effort. And every country today recognizes, and including the CDC in the US, which did a very good review and came out they acknowledged all of the failures and mistakes which basically are related to the fact that the CDC at the center has no power or connection with the state public health. So every state in the US, independent public health authority, they need not share the data. They may or they may not, or they could share it by delayed. They don't have to follow the recommendations of the national CDC. So when you're dealing with an emergency, you cannot have a situation in a large country where every state is doing its own thing. So they have recognized that not only was the investment in public health going down, down over the years, but that th this relationship between center and states in terms of public health action was fragmented and they need to bring it back. They need a new law uh, which will allow this to, to happen in a much uh, more efficient manner. So I think it's very good for countries to look back, for states, for large countries like India, the states could do that kind of review of the last three years, what went well, and a lot of things were done well, maybe what did not go so well, which today we can look back and really look at the reasons why, what are the gaps, and how do we fill those gaps for the future, because certainly, um, this pandemic is not the last pandemic. Let us hope that there is, doesn't happen again in the near future, but one can never tell when the next zoonotic infection is going to jump from an anim animal or a bird to a human. We've, we've seen avian influenza today around the world is spreading quite worryingly across many species of birds, both wild and domestic. And it's a matter of a few mutations before it becomes uh, transmissible. It does occasionally transmit to humans, but so far it's not transmitting human to human, right? So once that human to human transmission occurs, then of course, uh, uh, avian influenza pandemic would be extremely bad. So we need to think about the root causes of this. And again, the public health today in the 21st century has to think much more broadly than focusing only on healthcare delivery and the traditional public health services of water and sanitation and vector control and making sure that systems are operating, et cetera. Even things like entomology actually is important. And I think we need to see, do we have enough public health entomologists in, the, in our public health programs? Because vector-borne diseases are going to be uh, important. They already are and they're going to change in nature, and they're going to change their geographies as with climate change, and unexpected vector-borne diseases, like we have scrub typhus in India, large number of scrub typhus cases are not recognized, not diagnosed, not treated, and could end up you know, dying. I remember going to Gorakhpur, year after year, there used to be this outbreak, which was just known as an encephalitis outbreak, and, and uh, eventually by doing the genomic studies, we found that a lot of them were because of scrub typhus and a simple treatment actually can deal with this infection and that these children don't need to die. So the deaths today have gone down dramatically, but that's because the diagnosis and treatment of scrub typhus was scaled up. So I think we 
we need to use new technologies like gene sequencing that we have today. We've used it for COVID. We need to think where else in public health and, and an outbreak of an unknown disease is obviously a very uh, obvious example where you would want to use um, whole genome sequencing or metagenomics as it's called to try to identify what the pathogen is. So building that capacity at the state level but then going down at the sub uh, to the district but also much below the district level because ultimately epidemics begin and end in communities. They don't just happen somewhere. It's always some community which will have the first case and if you have a cadre of people who are trained to recognize and pick up something that's going unusual happening and they are able to report quickly, investigate, use uh, technologies, the data collection mechanisms need to be good and there needs to be authority also given at that level to people to take action. So decentralization is extremely important in terms of building the capacity and also the ability to take um, action immediately because I think the question is going to be next time is how quickly can we limit it? Can we limit and prevent an outbreak or epidemic from becoming much bigger or becoming a pandemic? And I think Kerala did extremely well with the Nipah uh, infection on both, on both occasions. But with an airborne virus, with an airborne pathogen, it's much more difficult than with a pathogen which is born, blood-borne or through body secretions because there the ice, that's why the SARS-1 and SARS-2 were so different because SARS-1 was much more spread, you know, person to person, uh, droplets, and also people presented, they all got sick. So you didn't have asymptomatic spread. And so the moment somebody had symptoms, you could isolate them, do the contact tracing, isolate all the contacts, and that's how in eight months, SARS-1 was actually controlled, even though it had spread around the world and it was in many countries. SARS-2, we found out later that there was asymptomatic spread and that not everybody had symptoms and also that it was aerosolized and it could infect people in the same room even if you're not very close to the next person. So these things we learnt over the months of 2020 and therefore the, the advisories and responses also kept changing. Um, so the, we have to look at what are the essential public health functions that are needed and that really needs to be, I mean, the principle really needs to be that it has to be based on um, the needs of the, of the population. So one needs to constantly have a mechanism and a surveillance so that you know uh, you're monitoring and evaluating the population's health status, whether it is through surveys like NFHS or other kinds of surveillance, and also looking at the risk factors to health and paying attention to those. We need a whole uh, focus on how an emergencies will be, will be managed. There needs to be attention to the governance, to the regulations and the legislation. And I think probably some of our laws which are outdated really need to be revised as to how uh, the, the disasters will be dealt with. And when we think about public health, we shouldn't think only about infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases, but we also now need to think about not only biological threats, but chemical, nuclear, so all types of threats uh, which could uh, come to the population. And then you need always uh, uh, for public health a multi-sectoral uh, planning. And the reason is that many of the threats to health are not within really the domain of the health ministry, but would lie outside. As an example, road traffic accidents right, which is a, a leading cause and in fact it's increasing. Uh, if you look at um, developing countries versus developed countries, there the road traffic accidents are on the decline and in the developed world with more and more traffic, um, it's increasing. So road traffic accidents mm -hmm. is one example. Another one is air pollution, which of course impacts, as we know, all our organ systems. Another example is our diets. What do we eat, the whole food system? What do we get as subsidized food? What are we able to buy and eat? Why are we eating these things? The whole shift of diets from something that used to be healthy, homemade, from locally available 
um, more of fruits, vegetables, millets, coarse cereals. The whole thing has now shifted to refined carbohydrates, high sugar, high salt, high fat diets. And that is what is driving um, the, all of our non-communicable diseases, which are all going up. And so physical inactivity is another risk factor for non-communicable diseases. And of course, tobacco and alcohol. Mental health um, is the other major um, non-communicable disease. So between injuries and road traffic injuries and these risk factors for non-communicable diseases, you have a range of public health problems, large ones, where the solutions lie outside the health sector. And that is why health has to be elevated even at the political level, and it, and it did get elevated during the pandemic, but we hope that that can continue because it is very clear that without good health, you cannot have economic progress. And so if you want to dream of being uh, economically doing much, much better in the future, I think a prerequisite for that is to have a healthy population, which includes good nutrition, uh, especially for pregnant women and young children because of the brain development of the child being impacted and that affects cognitive development and so it's a question of human capital. If we want to really make use of the demographic dividend and as you know we are all talking today about India becoming the most populous country in the world but also saying that we have a young population, that we have the demographic dividend, well I think Kerala is already in that demographic transition where, which the whole of India is going to be in a few decades. But for the next few decades, yes, we will have that advantage, but only if our young people are well nourished, they have good brain development, and also, of course, good education and skilling, in which case they can be highly productive members of society. So I think we need to, the point is to think about the risk factors for health, not just the downstream what do we do when people get sick? We set up more cardiac care centers, more dialysis centers. There will be no end to that, actually, if we're not turning off the tap at the, the other end. So this is why we today talk more about health promotion and disease prevention being really important. And that, again, is something that people teach in community medicine. And PSM was always about that. But most of us paid no attention to that because, obviously, the clinical aspects of medicine are always much more exciting and interesting rather than thinking that's very boring, let somebody else think about prevention. But unfortunately, the more uh, you see uh, about health and the more you understand, you think, you realize that that actually probably is the most uh, critical. Community engagement, participation, uh, and social mobilization are extremely important. And we saw uh, that, again, during the pandemic, that there was a mobilization of a different kind and that was misinformation. And this was very shocking to me that there could be so much of misinformation and anti-science and anti-vaccine activities going on when you would expect that most people would welcome the new tools, the vaccines that, would have got, that got us out of the pandemic. But even before there were vaccines available, the anti-vax group had already started their misinformation campaigns, even before. And of course, once there were vaccines available, they used to feed a lot of uh, half-truths, actually. So the, the most clever misinformation is, or disinformation is always when there is a very small grain of truth. And then you take that and you distort it. You know, you take some figure from somewhere, which is actually a, a scientific paper, but then distort it and change the interpretation so that it becomes a very scary and I saw that a lot with vaccine side effects because, yes, all countries were asked to report vaccine side effects. It's important. Pharmacovigilance is important because especially when you're dealing with a new vaccine and a new disease and when hundreds of millions, billions of people are getting it, you need to keep on studying the safety of these vaccines. So there were reports that there were these, uh, you know, clotting defects happening with the viral vectored vaccines, that there were rare cases of myocarditis in young men with the mRNA vaccines, but they were four or five cases per million, you know. So the benefit risk of the vaccines was still extremely high. It was extremely positive, the benefit risk ratio. 
But the anti-vax group would pick those couple of cases and uh, then distort all the numbers and without any denominators would and make very scary videos, etc. So misinformation and disinformation is here to stay. Social media is here to stay. We, we all, I'm sure, experienced it. And I met somebody from Africa, from a country in Africa, who told me that there in, 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 in that country, it's a small West African French-speaking country, that their population relies on WhatsApp to get health information. They do not rely on the government. They do not believe what the government is telling them. And so they rely only on WhatsApp. So you can imagine that if these videos can go around on WhatsApp, what impact that would have on the population. And sometimes, quite often, these videos are coming from outside the country, but then they get uh, circulated. So public health to diagnostic so that we stop the overuse of antibiotics. And we are actually diagnosing and treating what uh, people have. And I gave the example of scrub typhus, which without a diagnostic test, you will not be able to make the diagnos diagnosis. So I think having essential medicines essential diagnostics list, essential list of health technologies is going to be important. And finally, research. So research is, um, is what actually helps you to improve what you're doing. You can call it monitoring and evaluation. You can call it impact evaluation. You can call it implementation research. So this is not research which is happening in labs I'm talking about, but I'm talking about public health research which addresses also some of the social uh, issues, economic uh, issues, the barriers that people have, um, looking at gender issues, looking at issues of access, of equity, these, these, all these can be actually addressed by research, which could be just looking at secondary data, analyzing it. Uh, we, have, we do a lot of data collection in our country. We also need to be able to use that data to make policy decisions um, in a much more real-time way. So I think that cooperation between academia and um, public health is also very important and we need to encourage much more of that and I hope that the Kerala University of Health Sciences will take a lead really in the interest and passion for research in medical students um, by exposing them to research during undergraduate. The way that I got interested in research was as a school student, as a science talent scholar, I spent one summer holiday in a lab in Calcutta in, with a very famous uh, geneticist, human geneticist called Professor Archana Sharma. That was for my science talent project. And my project was to, um, she took me to the clinic, the genetics clinic in the medical college hospital, where I saw a young girl with Turner syndrome maybe one or two years older than I was at that time, and she had been brought in. Uh, those who are doctors will know that Turner syndrome is a, is a chromosomal abnormality, but the second X chromosome is missing. And so the girl never attains her uh, puberty or secondary sexual characteristics. So she was brought there, and we drew blood, and we went back to the lab, and then I was given the task of karyotyping and producing her, uh, you know, the pattern of chromosomes, and it was the most exciting moment for me when I did the karyotyping, of course I was helped by people in the lab, but I had to do it myself and saw that this girl had only one X chromosome. And that really kindled for me, I must have been you know, 14 or 15 years old, the passion for research. Uh, and for a long time I wanted to be a geneticist, but um, I think the exposure during school and college years to research will definitely get more people interested and in wanting to take up research. And there are so many different kinds of research that are possible to do. Uh, it does, you don't have to be in, um, in a highly uh, endowed research institute to do research. I know excellent public health researchers in our country who have done research in the most remote tribal areas. Abhay and Rani Bang are a good example of a couple that have made massive changes to policy and saved lots of lives by doing research, but you know, in a, uh, in a highly tribal area. And there are many more examples like that of people in private practice also who have really contributed to our understanding of, of disease. So research, many people think you need a big, huge team. You need, lot of, you need basically good data collection. You need to understand the problem. Of course, you need to ask a, a good research question and then use the data. 
to, to address that. So I think that we also have going to have another challenge of how we are going to um, use artificial intelligence. Um, digital technologies, yes, I think they've been a game changer and we saw telemedicine, telehealth really take off during the pandemic and many other digital applications. So I think those things should be here to stay, they should be expanded, there should be more innovation in the way that they are used, made more effective, to, especially for outreach, and um, that is there. But the use of artificial intelligence also offers lots of opportunities, but there are also some risks, and I think that what we need is a careful look at what the technology, technology is, what problem is it trying to solve, and do we need it, firstly? Now, blindly, we should not be thinking that every problem, the solution is technology. But very often, technology can help. It can be complementary to what the healthcare workers are doing. For example, I saw, I was traveling in Orissa in a remote uh, place, and um, the CHO there in the sub-center, in the health and wellness center, she uh, not only had the basic drugs, et cetera, and she could take care of patients, but she was regularly connecting with the doctors at the at the CHC or at the district hospital whenever she needed a specialist consultation and it was happening on a regular basis. So patients who came to that health and wellness center actually got a consultation with a specialist. And so that kind of thing, you know, I think really took off during the pandemic and it's definitely should be strengthened and expanded further. There could be applications of AI in things like X-ray reading, for example, if we want to do X-ray screening of large populations for TB. AI could help us. There are many validated AI algorithms. Similarly, there are applications for cervical cancer screening, also for reading of pathology slides where there are, uh, you know, there's a lack of pathologists and so on. So there are many applications where AI could be a very good tool uh, to improve our um, healthcare delivery, but ultimately we have to keep an eye on health outcomes and think, is this new technology helping us to achieve better health outcomes? Just like Dr. Chitra Gopal, her, the goal was to reduce maternal mortality, and so what she did, the intervention of training midwives, ultimately, if it, if it had not resulted in that reduction in maternal mortality, then probably they would have had to go back and think, okay, what went wrong in that? What was the missing ingredient? So the health outcome is important, and um, so technology can help us, but again, that needs people who are looking at those outcomes, so it needs researchers and it needs statisticians and data scientists. So that whole area also of public health, probably that we need to strengthen further the, the whole thing of data science, being able to link different databases today. We talk about big data, et cetera, but you need people who understand how to, to use those data sets and to do the analysis. And ultimately, it's, uh, it's about um, One Health, and I'm happy that Kerala seems to be quite taking also planning to take a lead in that and, and, and set up a center of excellence for One Health. It is going to be in the future about One Health, the environment, the whole animal kingdom, and human beings uh, will need to live in harmony if uh, you know, we're going to combat the big challenges that are going to face us in the future, including climate change, antimicrobial resistance, and of course the threat of future pandemics. So I hope I haven't depressed all of you too much <laughs> by what I've said, but I've just tried to look ahead a little bit, but also take inspiration from the past and not be uh, dejected that we cannot solve some of the problems that we have today, even though they seem very, very large. I mean, the problem of obesity and diabetes for me today is one of the biggest challenges we have, but there are examples of countries that have reversed it by taking the right public policies. So what we need is the combination of public health and good policy makers who can come together and bring those right public policy levers in place actually to help people to live uh, a healthier life. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for the wonderful oration. In fact, we are all uh, th thankful to be here. Uh, to be to to witness the oration, I'm sure that it will be a landmark event uh, in the history of our uh, alumni activities. So generally, conventionally, we don't uh, permit any sort of questions, comments uh, for the orations. 
but then here we will have an opportunity for the subsequent sessions. So may I request the august presence of uh, the family members, Sri Bala Gopal and Sri Mohan Gopal, when the uh, oration memento is being awarded to Dr. Swami Nathan. Yeah, yeah, our, our, our advocate DV also. Thank you so much. It was very comprehensive. And all these young people. Are thinking, thank you. So before going to the second session, our Dr. M. K. Sinaira has edited a book on uh, speech, language, and the hearing. I request Madam to release this book. Uh, M. K. C., please come. Ah. I am also an associate editor. With him. And this is, please. Sorry, the book was edited by John Bunnicker, so you should receive it. I have only done the work, you did the editing. Please Hello. receive it. Thank you, madam. Uh, just one announcement. Uh, we'll be going to the second session immediately and we'll finish it before 5 o'clock. But meanwhile, we have a snack box will be uh, given to you here. You can have it, but uh, see, see, please see that it is nothing is spilled over to the floor. It's a box. So because of the lack of time, we don't want you to go out and have it. So and uh, in between, uh, I request uh, Mr. Balagopal uh, to give a few words as felicitation. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Somya, um, all the distinguished people in the audience, I am standing between a riveting uh, oration and a very lively uh, you know, panel discussion. So I intend to make this very, very brief. Um, my, my, my duty here on behalf of the family is to just say how grateful we feel to all of you, um, particularly the Alumni Association, for having taken this enormous effort to make this such a wonderful success. So uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, it came out of a very small suggestion for which I have to thank uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan who's sitting here because we had a family uh, WhatsApp meeting and since the Dr. and Mrs. Vijay Raghavan are part of our family, they were there and uh, he, he described, uh, the, he was the only person who had seen my mother in the, in the form of a teacher and uh, he spoke uh, from the heart about that. And then uh, it happened to uh, other people as well to believe, that, I mean, it, it, this small spark actually led us to come to meet with Dr. John and others here in Trivandrum and the faculty, uh, sorry, the Alumni Association. Uh, thereafter, they, they just took the whole thing, you know, in, as their own sort of contribution and our role was very, very uh, small. So I want to say that it's been a, I mean, one of the most unparalleled experiences in my life to have such a group of uh, people who are so passionately devoted to learning and to uh, coming together. And uh, I must, if I have to mention one person, I, I think it would be Dr. Kavita, who is the life and spirit of the, the dynamo behind the organization. Uh, appreciation to Dr. Kavita, the honorary secretary. Uh, of this uh, association. I'm, I'm hesitating not to mention other names because there are too many. So I hope you forgive me for not thanking everybody. For, from the family's uh, side, we are overwhelmed with gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, as I mentioned, all this, uh, the inspiration and the initiative has come from uh, Mr. Balawal and Mr. Malam Gobal. And uh, we are extremely thankful to you on behalf of the Alumni Association. Now, uh, I, I request our uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mohan Gundamel, to come and just uh, light the lamp for to mark the inauguration of the Master class series. Binema, please come. And also, the master class series, in fact, is an ambitious academic project of uh, Aluminium Association, BC Mathuru Academy. Uh, the uh, academic wing of the association. What is this uh, actually, really? Uh, this is, an, in fact, a special platform uh, of alumni where the students, the faculty, the faculty, I mean, not only just in-house, you know, but also uh, our own alumni uh, in good positions uh, in and uh, outside the country who are able to contribute, they come together for an extended learning purpose. What extended in the sense that, you know, beyond the National Medical Council norms. That is the extended uh, syllabus. So I think that is the sort of, uh, you know, uh, the activity which we are actually aiming at with uh, master class series. And so we will be taking up uh, the issues, local issues, so that uh, the public will be the beneficiary, the government will be benefited in policy making, and other beneficiaries, of course, will be the students and the faculty without any boundaries because we are actually giving it in the hybrid platform across the world. So I think this, I feel, is the, our first claim of Trivandrum Medical College for the autonomous status, you know, because we are capable of doing it with our vast resources globally available. So with this, I would like to, uh, to invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, to inaugurate this ambitious project. I, re I request uh, uh, Tinku Bissell, Madam, Dr. MKC, Iqbal Sir, uh, Thomas Matthew, all to come. Martha and Sir, please come to the stage and uh, principal. Both of you, both of both principals. Please come. Yes.
request Dr. Mohan and Kunamel to say a few words. Good evening to all. Professor Soumya Swaminathan, eminent leaders of medical fraternity and health administration and uh, my dear uh, friends, dear students. I'm extremely happy to stand in this historic podium of the first medical college of Kerala. And we are discussing about Kerala model health and one of the main component behind the Kerala health model is nothing other than this medical college. The graduates came out of this medical college. Thousands and thousands of graduates who came out of this great medical college who went all around the world, all around the Kerala and who subsequently created more medical colleges in Kerala. And all of them together created, and I proudly say, um, Kerala model. And one of the studies by Center for Development Studies, it says that Kerala's morbidity pattern is bad when compared to UP or Bihar. It is almost same. But unfortunately, uh, people in Kerala don't die because there is a health intervention in between. And the reason they said is that the high female literacy in Kerala. So the female at home knew that somebody is sick and they are taken to the nearest health facility. And this health facility was provided by the government. And also the graduates who came out of these medical colleges and they were available in single doctor clinics. So thousands of such single doctor clinics were there, primary health centers were there, and the lady in the, at home, who is a literate person, could take them and therefore, because of that, uh, in spite of the high morbidity, the mortality was reduced. This is one of the theories said and many people still believe that that is the uh, fact. But now, uh, from Kerala University of Health Sciences, I have very interesting data. When female literacy improved, the health of the uh, state improved. Now, what about the health professionals coming out of Kerala University of Health Sciences. Now today, my data is that 82% of the health professionals coming out of Kerala University of Health Sciences are females, are girls. So whether this is going to affect our health situation, we'll have to see. I positively believe that this is going to be a huge change. And our uh, health professionals, 82% are uh, girls and then the maximum number of uh, boys are in medicine there are also there are only 33 percentage 67 are girls this is a very very important uh, point which we can discuss now regarding research uh, uh, as professor Soumya Swaminathan has said I realized that it is the job of the university. Kerala University of Health Sciences is essentially a new university, just 11 year old. And in the initial years, we were establishing, stabilizing the university. And now all the clinical courses, everything is stable. And we are producing world class medical professionals, nursing professionals, Ayurveda. And we have a brand name. And they are good clinicians. They are good nurses. But then we are not good researchers. We admit that. So now we have started that. And now as on today, we have got more than 100 approved research centers under Kerala University of Health Sciences. We have got about 500 approved research guides and 450 research scholars registered with us. So it's a beginning. And this beginning uh, definitely will grow. And the issues raised by uh, Professor Swaminathan the One Health issue, all these we are addressing. In fact, even before COVID came, 
Kerala University of Health Sciences conducted a program on One Health in collaboration with Veterinary University and Forest Department and thinking that such, such zoonosis will come and then it came. And because it came, when, when COVID came, actually we could not progress with One Health program because we could not meet. And now we have controlled COVID. Now we will go ahead with One Health program. And with these few words, I declare today's program inaugurated. This is a very interesting inauguration. We are conducting the inauguration in the middle of the program. But such changes we can always do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So this comes to the end of the uh, oration by Madam. Madam, uh, Madam actually touched upon all the all the issues, uh, health equity, one health, public health, how we can, uh, all these things. Even even though COVID is actually coming to an uh, to an uh, to the lower lowest level, still we have to continue all the other measures. Thank you, Madam, for giving an, a wonderful, excellent presentation, especially on the field of public health, which is actually before. Up to the COVID, it is actually a public health has not, not got as uh, not accepted by the general general population, even the medical fraternity as a, an important thing. Now it, it got an uh, actually had a very very good role, and people actually recognizes it, and we also uh, taken it up. So looking forward for the uh, few excellent future of the uh, our population and all. Madam, thank you all. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you, madam. So I think everybody had a snack and uh, water. I, I request uh, Tingu Vichar, ma'am, to come to the stage, and also the chairperson, moderator for the next session. Please come. And uh, actually, Dr. Sujada Rao, Dr. M. B. Pillai, Dr. S. S. Lal, and Dr. Aru Ashokan, they will be joining on Zoom. And uh, there will be, yes. Now, I request uh, Iqbal Saar to take over. Thank you. Within 10 minutes, madam. Uh, this is 4 30. First few minutes. I don't have to speak again. I'm open for my. Okay, okay, okay. Am I required to speak? It is. 100%. 100%. No, it's not. That's what we have. In fact, it was quite appropriate on the part of the organizers to have this discussion on Kerala health model after the Chitra Gobalan oration. Because I think that it is almost like a poetic justice offered to Chitra Gobalan. Because she was, I was fortunate to be her student. She was a great teacher. Not only that, she not only talked about public health, but he inspired us. And I would rather place her on line with the great public health experts in India, like D. Banerjee and Imrana Kathak. So she was at that level. It is quite appropriate now. Why I said that it is a poetic justice? Because when she talked about 
public health, she was actually talking about social determinants of health. And you know that Kerala has achieved very high health status. A few months earlier, we used to say that we are almost on par with developed countries. But I can now say with confidence, with latest figures coming from sample, sample uh, registration system, SRS data, uh, that Kerala is on par with developed countries. And if Chitra Gopalan was alive today, she would have been extremely happy since she tried to bring down the maternal mortality by training uh, the trained midwives. The latest uh, maternal mortality figure of Kerala is as low as 19 per 100,000 live births. And you know that the maternal mortality rate of USA is 32. It's lower than the US figures. And the national, of course, is as high as 97. <clears throat> and when it comes to uh, infant mortality rate, you know that for a decade, it was stagnating at 12. We did not know what was happening. Then we looked at the neonatal mortality. And then my latest, in fact, our attempt was to make it a single digit. And we achieved it. It is 6. Well, USA is 7. Its latest figure is 7. So therefore, you see that it is because of intervening in the social determinants of health as advocated by public health experts like Chitra Govan, we could achieve this. And the turning point, the crucial issue, if you take the one single indicator that can change the health status of any, any population, is education, especially female education. And if you look back, you see that all the reform movements in Kerala gave thrust to education, especially female education, whether it is Srinarayana Guru movement or Mahanma Iyengali movement or whether it is Father Chavra Kuryakos or whether uh, Maulavi, Vakkam Maulavi, everybody gives the thrust to uh, education. That is one of the reasons why we, Kerala could achieve this. And secondly, second uh, social determinant is poverty. And Kerala has got a well-functioning well public distribution system of food. And the rural poverty was largely eradicated because of our agrarian reforms. And when we come to the towns and cities, we know that it is said that the rate of exploitation is less in Kerala compared to other parts of the Kerala. So the minimum wages has been implemented here. And because of all these diverse social determinants of health, which Chitra Gavar and, and others were advocating that Kerala could achieve this health status. Maybe Dr. Saumya was referring repeatedly to the equity issue. And therefore, I may say that WHO, not anybody from Kerala, other international agencies said they described Kerala as good health at low cost, good health with social justice and equity. This was a very typical description of Kerala health. Good health at low cost because even though health cost is increasing in Kerala, from a global perspective, say high achievers, so I was looking at the U.S. figures this morning, it is as high as per capita health expenditure is as high as twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per capita per annum. You may not believe the latest uh, uh, GS, uh, uh, Indian expenditure, Kerala expenditure has been published in today's paper, which shows that Kerala health expenditure is around ten thousand rupees per capita per annum, both private and public. That means it is around one hundred and twenty dollars. That is one hundredth of expenditure Kerala is spending, but we are achieving the weekly high status. Now, but however, I may alert here that <coughs> these terminologies like Kerala model, when I was the vice chancellor, we gave an honorary doctorate to Amartya Sen. He has written a lot about Kerala. In fact, we used to say that he is an unofficial ambassador of Kerala. <laughs> and he got his Nobel Prize precisely writing about Kerala model also. But he said that. He alerted us. Don't say Kerala model. You say Kerala experience. Because a model is something to be emulated by others. And Kerala could achieve this much because of various social uh, uh, social reasons that happen in entirely different social circumstances, which cannot be emulated or replanted to other states. And therefore, you better say Kerala state. And also, the title is said that uh, Kerala model, the challenges ahead. There also I may modify by saying the, the challenges are here now. Even though I am also a proponent of this Kerala experience, 
written and talked a lot. There are a lot of contradictions within the Kerala, so-called Kerala experience of health. We are currently facing a lot of problems. I will say it one single example and then stop my presentation. You take the out-of-pocket expenditure of Kerala, is the highest in India. The out-of-pocket expenditure in India is highest in Kerala, in spite of a very vibrant public health system. In fact, the coverage of public health hospitals is as high as 70% in Kerala. It's not so. That is why we could manage COVID very effectively. We have a very vibrant public health system and a very dynamic local self-government institutions to which many public health institutions have been handed over. But still, and we have an excellent uh, insurance system, both the Kairuni Aryogya, Suresha, Badadi, Khas, and Midisap. But still, the expenditure is high. And we are having the highest morbidity state in India. Both lifestyle diseases, infectious diseases, uh, trauma-related deaths, disabilities. If you take anything, the morbidity is extremely high. And therefore, uh, the Kerala model or experience of health is riddled with a lot of problems. And we will have to address that. I am sure that these issues will be uh, uh, will be highlighted here. I do not want to preempt uh, this discussion by making statement, further statements. Uh, John Manikar, are we going to show this? Uh, ah, see, so we have two presentations sent. Uh, they are recorded and sent to us, one by Dr. M. V. Pilla and the second by Dr. N. S. S. Lal. Uh, and R. V. Ashokan. And when, uh, when is our secretary talking? Hello, greetings from Texas, United States. Uh, it's a matter of great honor and privilege for an alumnus like me to be present at this historic event uh, in the development of our medical college. Congratulations to our alumni association headed by Dr. John Panikir and Mr. Balagobal, who is heading the establishment of Dr. Chitra Gobalan, 100th birth anniversary endowment for invited lectures in public health and all the organizers behind this historic event in our campus. I call it this historic not because of the lack of a better adjective, but it is really historic. This medical college was founded by late Dr. C. O. Karanagaran, a microbiologist of distinction, an expert on public health, and uh, a creator of the first medical college in Kerala. A member of the family of Dr. C. O. Karanayaran is now stepping in with the second phase of the international development of this campus, and that's Dr. Chitra Gobal. She was my professor. Sometimes these things happen for a purpose. Somebody is watching from above, handing over the torch from Dr. C. O. Karnagaran to a family member to take this institution to higher levels of excellence and reputation. And he couldn't have chosen a more appropriate occasion than this because Kerala is facing a major problem in public health over the last three to four years. And this is where the concept of one Health is attaining importance day by day. One Health is a term coined both by Center for Disease Control and WHO to denote an approach which is multidisciplinary and collaborative at the local, regional, national and global level to fight mainly zoonosis but it expands to include other things. We know that zoonoses are diseases transmissible from animals to human beings. Kerala had its share in the last few years. In fact, the first Nipah in India was reported from Kerala. The first cases of COVID came from China to Kerala. Name it, any new viral incidents or any new viral or bacterial infections will find its place in Kerala community sooner or later. So this concept of 
one health which expands to include all living organisms on this planet and all the and also the environment we share is based on the premise that we cannot maintain optimal health without taking care of the health of animals plants and our shared environment we had plenty of ex um, experience in this field in fact the hiv disease came to human beings from monkeys the ebola is a successor coming to kerala we have the example of the nipa and the covid finally traced to the bats the salmonella also is connected to fish and some animal infections the bird flu which was considered to be exclusive for the birds recently reported to have undergone mutation and the humans can catch the disease of all the things a disease called rabies which we thought we could prevent by anti rabies vaccine we had a bitter experience recently we burned our fingers some of our vaccines didn't work either because they were not given for the right indication or maybe the potency had been lost but the fact remains that animal bone diseases are attacking us from different corners be it bacterial viral or rickettsia it is here to stay add to that the concern of deforestation right now our news media is replete with reports of arik kombal roaming around and we couldn't we couldn't fix him so far reports are coming about a stray bear getting lost in an abandoned well and finally dying drowning we couldn't help him or her i don't know the same thing is happening in, in northern part of kerala why not the tigers leopards and bears are encroaching on to the human habitation a few months back even as close as nayar dam in trivandrum had a wild tiger encroaching on to the human dwellings so it's important that we accept this fact in a crowded state with a population density very high it's important that we realize that the concept of one health which encompasses collaborative multidisciplinary approach to improve the outcome of healthcare by incorporating the health of the human beings with animals plants and our shared environment has arrived the good news is one of the pioneers of trivandrum medical college had the vision to see this he donated his own land about 8 to 10 acres of prime land owned by him to kerala government out of his sheer love for the plant kingdom in puttanthu trivandrum the land is now owned by kerala government and his family was inquiring about establishing a suitable memorial for him there is no better memorial to dr late dr m tangavelu than combining the concept of one health partnering with the visionaries who are now organizing dr chitra gabalan memorial lecture and bring in some synergy we can do that because we have the resources we have the land we have the manpower we have the know how if there's a single lesson we learned out of the covid epidemic it is a fact that today we have to think globally and act locally nobody is infallible the united states made a lot of blunders and so did the united kingdom scandinavian countries france germany japan so the future of india's public health is going to be our challenge we cannot wait for a band master to give us orders it's in this context that i congratulate dr soumya swaminathan 
for accepting our invitation and coming to take a leadership role to realize our dream. I, talk, I started my talk by quoting history, a history handing over the torch from Dr. C. O. Karnagaran to late Dr. Chitra Gobalan and her family. I conclude my words by coming back to history because Dr. Sabmiya Swaminathan and her father have rendered yeoman services to this nation. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, the architect of India's Green Revolution, has to be respected, has to be remembered and admired for his signal contributions. Today, his daughter is kindling the lamp by taking over the torch to make a green revolution in healthcare of Kerala by helping us to establish, preferably, a Dr. M. Thangavelu Memorial Center for Own Health in Trivandrum. And that will be a perfect tribute to two exemplary visionaries, Dr. Siya Karnayaran and Dr. M. Thangavelu. Dr. Soumya Swaminathan is a real messenger carrying this great dream of ours. It's a matter of utmost satisfaction that she, the daughter of India's Green Revolution, is here today to help us to rekindle a project of One Health by combining the health of our flora and fauna. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. M. V. Pillay is highlighting here the concept One Health and One World. Uh, it should not be misunderstood that the One Health, One World is a new concept at all. It has been, actually it was earlier, in the early 20th century, uh, a veterinary epidemiologist by name Calvin Schaube started talking about One Health uh, concept. Uh, but then a COVID experience uh, has made us to reintroduce One Health, One, one Health con uh, concept which essentially means that if you want to protect the health of human beings, you will have to protect the environment and the health of the animal world. This is in effect means uh, one health, one world. Again, in this case also, the Kerala state has taken some early in initiative, even before the COVID, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. The Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University has got a center which is called One Health Education Advocacy Research and Training Center, which was established in 2014. And later, just before the COVID, uh, 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 a health university called a meeting where I also participated in that discussion. And now the Kerala Home and has already established a center. But as uh, Dr. Pillai is suggesting, if we can make use of the land donated to Kerala government by Dr. Tangovelu's family, we can actually build a major center for One Health, uh, One World. That is the, the full term is One Health, One World center here. Now, uh, Dr. S. S. Lals, Panikar, uh, S. S. Lals, as, can you show that? Respected, Respected teachers, teachers and, and dear friends. friends. I am delighted, I'm delighted to, join to join this great event, event, which is of very high significance in the present context of public health and the state of Kerala. There is yet another reason for my happiness. It is the presence of the celebrated public health leader, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who has been a colleague and a friend of mine from my WHO days. In a quarter century of my global public health career, I have met hundreds of esteemed public health experts across the globe. Most have heard about Kerala's accomplishments in public health despite its many inherent struggles. This conference is an opportunity for us to remind ourselves that we, along with the rest of the world, are still at crossroads as COVID-19 has not left us and many of its impending impacts are still unknown. This is an important juncture for us to ask questions ourselves and introspect more. What right and wrong things did we do in the past? Are we continuing to do the right things? And what are the challenges ahead? 
While the state of Kerala has always been admired for its achievements in public health, we continue to encounter existing and newer problems. However, despite many shortcomings, we have a relatively strong and organized health system that does function. Thanks to the hundreds of visionary leaders we had even from the pre-independence times and a literate and health conscious population that adheres to our public health advice. We proudly talk about Kerala model in health. Yes, of course, this is something for us to be proud of. The Kerala model is unique because of our bigger achievements with a set of high quality of life indicators largely across the state despite our low per capita income. We are proud of our average life expectancy of 77 years, which is very close to the life expectancy of the USA, which is 79 years. Nevertheless, while we express our pride in lower mortality rates, there are areas where we need to escalate our efforts. For example, in dealing with morbidity due to growing non-communicable diseases. In addition, we have a high rate of suicides, 27 per 100,000 population, which is more than double the national average. We also record high rates of road accident deaths in the country. Problems of the elderly population are growing and we know that this is also an outcome of our increasing life expectancy. A long-term plan is necessary to address these problems. Emerging and re-emerging communicable diseases are still posing threats to the state. An old disease like TB remains a problem in our state too. It's estimated that over 25,000 people in Kerala fall sick due to TB every year. This is over three times the annual TB incident cases of the USA which has about 10 times the population of Kerala. There are many social determinants that impact our public health, which include our high density of population, low income status and unemployment. Public health impacts of increasing environmental calamities are also to be addressed with more preparedness in the future. We need to invest more in further aligning the local governments to our multitude of grassroots level health workers to improve access to health care for the poor. A higher and growing percentage of people seeking care from the private health sector is a reality in our state and we need to further explore ways to take advantage of the growing private health sector instead of accusing it or sidelining it. For this, we need to invent innovative public health public-private partnership models and insurance schemes to ensure standardized and affordable care across the private sector and to address catastrophic health expenditures of the poor who seek care from the private sector. It's high time that we reviewed our policies in medical education, especially regarding the number of teaching institutions and seats. Overall, our health policy needs continuous adaptation to the dynamic health ecosystem and alignment with evolving approaches like One Health. Above all, we need to escalate our investments in health both from the state and central governments. While we are proud of our achievements, it is important for us to remind our health workers and the people that Kerala model doesn't mean that we don't have any more major problems. We shouldn't allow complacency to set in. We need to continue to work hard. I am sure that the recommendations of this conference will act as an impetus for expanding our public health endeavors to newer horizons. Though I am in the middle of a long international journey, I readily agree to join this conference, though remotely, realizing the relevance of the discussions that are going to happen here. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Dr. John Paniker the senior leader of the medical profession, who is the soul of our alumni association too, for giving me an opportunity to address this August gathering. My sincere thanks to everyone who has been listening to my words.
about the increasing morbidity and second is about ppp or private public participation model now for your uh, for me just to remind you that one of our teachers dr cr soman who along with uh, dr pgk panikar of the center for development studies published a document in early 1980s wherein they coined a term that kerala health can be described as high morbidity low mortality syndrome <laughs> this was as early as early 1980s they said that low mortality high morbidity syndrome so when mortality comes down longevity increases naturally this is associated with increasing age can increase but the problem in kerala is that it is more than what we expect take diabetes kerala is the diabetes capital of india and now ca breast incidence is rising for those who are those communicable community medicine department students who are sitting here last several years then the communicable diseases that are uh, reported from kerala uh, will be dissolution as uh, dengue fever eds egypt sika has come during covid in fact last a decade i was saying that so long as eds egypt mosquito is there in kerala sika will come and it has come and i am afraid that yellow fever may come very shortly mortality rate is very high though we have a vaccine there are other diseases which we study leptospirosis every year roughly 50 people are dying of in government hospitals if you take private hospital also it will be more west nile disease japanese encephalitis scrub typhus leishmaniasis and last but not the least kaisner forrest disease such uh, infectious diseases are there so it is not only really lifestyle disease morbidity it is a double uh, morbidity that we are facing and our mental health status is extremely poor i have to just to verify it again there are studies published which indicates that the mental health status of keralites is poorer compared to the national average for 1000 persons there are around 272 mental health both treated treatable and treated to be treated and not to be treated cases in 2008 in 2018 it has gone up to 400 whereas the national average is only 100 so therefore many of the social evils that are present here the attack on women or drug addiction so home is increasing incidence of homicide may be attributed to our low mental health status and also another issue major issue in kerala is that the the health status of the marginalized in fact i myself have made a study of the tribal population in antrapadi and published a, a book in, i made this study with a few of my friends in 2013 Uh, i don't think the condition has of course only a very marginal i hope that the secretary will agree with me so the marginal is fisher folks health status has to be looked into now i have to say something on this private public participation issue i don't like that term at all because it has a very bad connotation see earlier the concept was that uh, the public sector is inherently bad so let us invade the private sector and make it good this was in early 19 Uh, in 2000 i mean uh, in 80s 90s this concept was globally accepted and several countries accepted its higher health care centers to private agencies in fact in a team that we sitted in bangladesh to is to see the effect of this what happened really was that the public sector was got privatized those patients who are taking getting poor i mean free treatment from hospitals are denied the service so therefore but we need we have a private sector we have to cooperate with them i would like to not ppp and kerala is an excellent example so there are some difference of opinion but you see that both the uh, cas as well as the medis uh, insurance scheme the private sector is cooperating of course they have complaints lot of complaints are there uh, with regard to rate the money that is uh, they are uh, remitted by the government etc there are problems but nevertheless they are uh, working secondly the covid period extreme good cooperation two medical colleges were handed over to government both the vayanad and kasaragod handed over as this, they were converted into uh, covid hospitals in kerala so therefore you see that kerala is showing a good example of private public cooperation i would rather say suggest that we drop the term private public 
participation, which is a very, has got a very bad connotation at the global level. Now, we have another presentation. Uh, Dr. Ashogan. Oh, Dr. Sujat Rao. Oh, she is live. I am sorry I did not see you. <laughs> uh, Madam, we were, I mean, of course, I need not introduce her. She was the health secretary. And moreover, more than that, Korean has published in 2017. I was reading and reading that fantastic. I am sorry that I kept you waiting. I did not see that uh, you were on it. Can you make that? No, no, no. Please, please. So, uh, And uh, they have done remarkable work in the last decade. And I, I think I would like to extend my full congratulations to the health department. But today, we are, Kerala has changed. It can no longer rest on the laurels of maternal infant mortality. You remove that and then say, is Kerala the exemplar state in the country? Uh, with a huge disease burden of 60-70% of non-communicable diseases, it is still having the dual burden of disease in terms of vulnerability 
to infectious diseases. And because the, of the dominance of the clinical uh, diseases, the, the attention of policy attention in Kerala government, I find, is very, very tuned in to medical treatment. Hospitals, you have one of the best in the country. There's no doubt about it that you're leaders in terms of medical treatment and uh, is one reason why not people, people don't die in Kerala as they would in, a, in any other state. But the point is, why should you even have high morbidity? That should also not be there. People should be healthy and the well-being should be universal. And so here, I personally feel that Kerala is missing the boat in not listening to the fact that the vulnerability to infectious diseases continues to be very high, no matter how good the medical treatment is. That's not going to be the answer. We've just come out of COVID a pandemic, which has literally stalled our and pushed us back as a country and Kerala as a state by several years in terms and in terms of loss of employment, economic growth, uh, well-being of the people. And we don't even know the full manifestations of what uh, COVID has done to our health. So we cannot ignore infectious diseases. And for that, the only remedy is to have the instruments and the implementational capacity, the technical capacity to deal with infectious diseases and prevent disease in the country and in Kerala state. So what I'm trying to get at, I think you can guess, is that there must be focus on developing and building a very strong public health cadre. You need the technical capacity. We need, the, we need a large number of epidemiologists, biostatisticians, data analysts, virologists, microbiologists, and so on. I mean, it's amazing how when COVID caught us, we barely, had, we just had one lab and uh, all the tests that had to go to Pune. I mean, after that, of course, Kerala caught on and got a lot of uh, lab, lab, laboratories, but you know, that kind of infrastructure that needs to be put in place. And I'm afraid here, the India's uh, disease surveillance program, which was funded by the World Bank, didn't really take off. Um, I have to admit that we didn't do a very good job, uh, largely be because the laboratory network was not put up, put in place. And a lot of epidemiology posts were left unfilled because we don't have that cadre. So when I talk about public health cadre, I also would like to make a quick distinction uh, that there are three verticals, as I see it, in public health. One is the core discipline, uh, you know, the core discipline of public health. That is what I mentioned just now, which also Saumya had in her talk elaborated widely. Virologists, I mean, the whole lot of entomologists and that kind of technically trained cadre of uh, public health uh, specialities. This cannot be, and I would like to underline this word, cannot be, that gap cannot be filled in by medical, clinical, trained, uh, no matter how brilliant the cardiologists are, how brilliant the orthopedicians are, they cannot fill that uh, gap because these people work in the laboratories, they work in the villages, they collect samples day in and day out for 365 days over years. So they are the ones who really know and can understand how, uh, if anything is going wrong and when a new infectious disease is cropping up or whatever. So that's a science by itself, and we need to respect that. The second is uh, the, the cadre of public health managers. And why I'm mentioning this distinction is because very often when we talk about public health cadre development, which is one of the policies which Niti Aayog is trying to push states to, um, to develop, and I think the central government is trying to incentivize states to build a public health cadre, is calling them public health management, go through an MPH uh, training program and you become a public health manager. But a manager is a different person. I have worked in the health sector for more than 20 years. I'm the public health manager, but I'm not an entomologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a, a, a biostatistician, but I can certainly, if I'm told, I can procure uh, all the inputs and see a synergistically synchronized uh, delivery of inputs I can do HR management. I can do those are the skills of a manager where you roll out and scale up medical interventions or scientific uh, discoveries and, and, uh, and uh, provide them to the people. You know, like vaccination has come. It's the public health managers who will ensure that once the vaccine is produced, it is supplied and uh, made, uh, and the last person in the village gets access to it. 
So I would like that our CMHOs in the district hospitals, our primary health care managers, they are managers who ought to be knowing how to scale up a program. But alongside, there must be this whole cadre of specialists. There must be a district epidemiologist. The surveillance program must be given a higher priority. And, you know, I was very sorry to hear when I went to one of the districts in Kerala that post-COVID, all the contractual appointees who were there to assist the surveillance program were withdrawn. Now, you can't just have uh, teams brought in for, uh, for uh, working on a particular pandemic situation, a crisis situation, and then they all collapse. And then they are they're, they're removed on financial grounds. Because vigilance in public health has to be there continuous and year long and all the time. So I am, uh, uh, I therefore, when any discussion I call for, which is public health, I readily accept because I firmly believe that we are not paying enough attention to public health. And I like to use any and every small or big platform to put this message out that please pay attention to public health. And, uh, you know, I'd like to just give. Um, a paper that was written long time back, very long time back, by China uh, uh, there. And they said India had controlled malaria. 1972, as you know, we had brought down malaria to almost uh, a negligible level from what it was when we had got independence. But then we gave up the vigil and we made all the malaria workers into multipurpose male workers. And therefore, the malaria program was collapsed because we said we have won malaria, but we have not. And today we're sitting with variants of uh, uh, the, the, those uh, infections, the chikungunya, dengue, and so on and so forth, which are highly debilitating. And in tribal areas in the north, they actually take lives. Our data, I, I question government data on the deaths due to malaria and vector-borne diseases. Uh, there were enough studies done to show that it is almost 10 times more than what we are claiming. But then that's a different uh, issue. But there are people dying. Though we have definitely done much, much, much better uh, of late because of bed nets and so on and so forth, but uh, we have still a long way. Uh, and I think climate change and all is going to have a huge impact on uh, on on these uh, environmental uh, um, sensitive diseases like malaria and vector borne diseases. So public health, despite all our technological advances, the AI. And uh, what have you, you know, and I think Osamia spelled it out very beautifully, what is the future of technology for us and how we may take advantage of it and use it. Uh, but still, I think our, the more we progress as a humankind, the more we interfere with the environment, the greater is going to be our vulnerability to all these infectious diseases. And it will be very foolish for us not to recognize this uh, vulnerability and recognize the immediacy of uh, public policy to pay attention to public health as a discipline and foster it and nurture it and say like uh, soldiers at Siachen, we need these soldiers guarding and preventing disease and guarding our health. Uh, so with these few words, I would like to say thank you again. Uh, and I wouldn't want to again repeat what has been said, One Health uh, and, uh, and you know the social determinants, their roles are very important. Kerala still has almost, though it's one of the better states on malnutrition, but it still has very high levels of anemia, 35%. Far, far better. I mean, you can't compare Kerala with North. Kerala has to compare with itself. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a problem that we still need to work on. And I think in terms of social determinants, there is some amount of uh, unfinished agenda that needs to be completed. And finally, my uh, also uh, what I would like to end with is that public health does not only mean infectious diseases and communicable diseases. You know, with the rise of NCDs, we, these are all lifestyle and long uh, lasting diseases, life, lifestyle diseases, which are um, there throughout the life. So they need monitoring. And so diabetes, hypertension, all need public health approaches to see that we, we don't get those, uh, those kind of diseases. So whether it's tobacco promotion or whether it's food, and nutrition intake or whatever other public health approaches. So I would like to, um, and why I'm repeatedly mentioning this in today's platform is largely because I know that Kerala government as such, uh, as its own policy, 
does not necessarily think that public health is important. Um, they think clinical doctors can fill in the gap. We have managed COVID. We have done it so well. We didn't need the public health people, so we can do it. That's the understanding I got when my when I visited Kerala last time. That did uh, unnerve me a bit, and I do think that maybe a deeper discussion is required because Kerala is prone to floods. Kerala is prone to infectious diseases. Kerala has a huge burden of no NCDs. They all need to be contained, prevented, and people's well-being has to be the solution. And we need to move more and more towards universal health care where no one should be paying any money for want of medical care. And the more we focus on medical care, and Dr. Iqbal, whether you call it public-private collaboration or public-private participation, at the end of it, if people have to go to a private sector and pay for their health, and pay out of their pocket, then you know we are not really having a equitable and a and a, uh, a health system which is being fair to all. I personally don't believe that people should pay for health. The government should pay for it, or somebody else should pay for it. But I cannot be denied health care only because I don't have the money to access that health care, whether public or whether it's in private sector. I don't care where. So for that, the first thing is for me not to fall sick. And if I do fall sick, the state stands by and sees that I get the full medical attention that I, as a citizen, I'm entitled to. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure and an honor to uh, be with uh, you all because you're more inspiring than uh, anything else. And I, and I feel very, very happy and uh, to be with Kerala because you know, the kind of work you people do is just so remarkable and outstanding. Thank you so much again for organizing this for Dr. Chitra Gopalan, because she really was a remarkable woman. Thank you. Yes. Do we care? Do we really care? <laughs> Yes, it is coming. It is coming along. I'm getting and and I'm taking three states for an in-depth review of did we care? Yes, Kerala was one, and the Tamil Nadu. The right hand side of your. Oh, those right. are two uh, drawings uh, which I picked up in Malaysia. Yeah, I have, I have not Malaysia, seen. sorry, in Burma, Burma. Yes, in yeah. I have seen it. So thank you very much. But <laughs> madam, I would yeah. like to bring to your attention that there is a gender dimension which has been yeah. largely overlooked in Kerala's yeah. longevity, increasing longevity. Yes, yes. Now women have got about six to eight, six to seven or eight years advantage over men. And yes. therefore women live longer than men. And that for the that is that is in fact a, a good result of uh, the public health intervention in Kerala. Yes. But nevertheless, what is now happening is that the number of widows in Kerala society is increasing. Now, if you look at the statistics, it is, I mean, I was taken aback. Above 60 years, 59 women are widows, whereas only 10% men are widows. Dr. Iqbal, along yeah. with widows, what is worrying is suicides. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, and Thank most you. of these women are. Uh, living alone in a big house, most, in, at least in the middle class families. And secondly, as far as health is concerned, uh, during the reproductive age, women's health is good compared to men. But in the late age, women's health is worse than that of men. So yeah. this is a major issue which needs to be addressed in Kerala. Now, thank you very much. Please keep online. Okay. Our health secretary is going to speak now. In fact, uh, uh, <laughs> I was fortunate to work with the doctor uh, uh, Tingu Biswal uh, in the state planning board, but not in health. She was at that time the secretary of water, water resources. resources. But what I, I noticed, noticed in her, her was, was that, that very, very meticulous workup work of uh, uh, the, the department she is she's she's working, working on. In fact, there was a competition between the planning board members and the health secretaries. Who is working up issues more? And she has always beaten me. I have to admit that. Now, she, if you want to describe her style of functioning, I would say that she is a proactive IAS officer. All IAS officers are not proactive. But Tingu Biswal is a proactive. And she has taken 
has become the uh, health secretary at the most appropriate time. I am only so worried that I am not in the planning board now. <laughs> Can you respond to some of these issues that has been raised here, especially the last one by uh, Dr. Sujada, that is about the public health care Got issue. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. Most importantly, with all these eminent personalities uh, and who I just heard, uh, uh, Sujata Rao Ma'am, uh, Dr. Soumya Som uh, Swaminathan, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the other uh, specialists in public health who have been here. So, uh, in fact, uh, when uh, Dr. Panikar asked me to join uh, the program as a, uh, as a panelist, I was like in, in the presence of all these eminent, uh, you know, uh, personalities in public health, uh, what, do I, uh, what do I contribute? Uh, but it has been, um, it for me, let me, uh, let me just take this opportunity for uh, actually calling me over uh, and to be a part of this because it's been a huge learning experience for me as well. Uh, as you know, I'm very new to health uh, and um, just about 10 months old. Uh, but as I was j talking to Dr. Uh, Swaminathan right now, Ours is essentially a challenge. For Kerala, it is a challenge of public health more than uh, anything else. And I totally agree with, uh, and maybe this is because I have, uh, uh, in Kerala, as you know, the uh, Department of Health Services and the Department of Medical Education are now bifurcated. And uh, the Department of, I have not been handling the Department of Medical Education. So I am in charge of the Department of Health Services and uh, the public health, uh, essentially, um, aspect of it. But is public health, uh, does it vest only with the health services? There is a major role that uh, the medical education department has to play in public health, especially when you're talking about community medicine. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch upon that later, but uh, uh, the fact remains, and I agree with Madam uh, Suchata Rao Ma'am, when she says that for some reason, and this has been my own, um, uh, my own reading of the situation in Kerala, that uh, we believe that clinicians can take care of everything. We believe that our solutions lie in uh, cure. And uh, to a larger extent, we have put our faith a lot more in that. I'm not saying that that is what we believe in. Of course, the state government uh, is committed to, uh, towards, uh, uh, understands the, the major role of public health. And therefore, you have campaigns like the Viva campaign, the anemia campaign, which ma Madam just pointed out. So we have public health challenges. I think one of our biggest curses is to have achieved these uh, uh, indicators, high, very high indicators in infant mortality and maternal mortality and other such, you know, indicators which have defined uh, uh, defined our status as uh, a leading state in health, and we are. But, uh, but then uh, the latest, uh, the NFHS survey, the last survey, clearly shows that we have areas of concern, and Dr. Iqbal, uh, you know that. Uh, areas of concern, both in terms of malnutrition and in terms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, the other indicators of uh, NCDs. NCD is a huge problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, as ma'am says, if you were to take out IMR and MMR, where do we stand? Do we, do we really, uh, can we really claim the mantle of being the best state in the country? Unfortunately, to some extent, yes, because uh, of the clinical support that we get. But the, the whole public health, health angle, whether it is surveillance for communicable diseases or it is surveillance for uh, non-communicable diseases. Now, and the entire systems and the entire technology in uh, place to address those challenges. A lot has happened. A lot uh, has been uh, in, term, in association with Government of India. And uh, as you know, they have been pushing us a number of things. But uh, for uh, various reasons, uh, our surveillance is still not one of the best. No, I'm not talking about Kerala per se, across the country. Across the country, our surveillance, uh, whether for communicable or non-communicable diseases, uh, is uh, not uh, one of the best. And that is a challenge that we need to address. And it is a challenge which has to be addressed not through clinicians. It is a challenge that can only be addressed through a public health card. Uh, not only, but uh, uh, in, in collaboration, uh, um, primarily by a public health cadre, and therefore the need for a cadre of specialists and a, uh, and a management cadre, and uh, a, a cadre of 
specialist who is actually collecting all this information, who is uh, giving us all the uh, information in terms of the lab results, in terms of the unusual events happening in the field, and, uh, and uh, capturing this information. We are a state which captures a lot of information. We capture a lot of data. What do we use? What do we do with that data? How do we use that data? How do we analyze it? How do we put it into policy practice, pl program planning in practice? Uh, and therefore, the use of technology over there. There are constraints from uh, the perspective of uh, the number of, uh, uh, you know, the human resources that we have to address uh, these challenges. And uh, how much can the public sector bring in? Uh, and the efficiency of use of resources. I think it is important for us from the public health perspective to be looking at the efficiency of allocation of resources and the use of those resources. Uh, in uh, the manner in which, uh, uh, because as you said, our bu budget is quite high. Kerala spends quite a, quite a large percentage of its budget on health compared to other states. But do we allocate it uh, properly to the areas of concern? And I think surveillance is an area of concern, whether it is uh, uh, communicable or non-communicable diseases that we should be looking at and we should be working on. But to have proper surveillance, it is important for us to have this entire cadre of you know, data analysts and data scientists and, uh, and, uh, and epidemiologists and entomologists and all of this. But, uh, but the analysis part, of course, not entomologists, but uh, uh, you know, epidemiologists. So this entire cadre needs to be built up. You were asking me about the public health cadre. So we are, uh, it is not that the state is not uh, uh, cued into the need for having a public health cadre. The CM himself has been pushing for the cadre. The, uh, the problem is in the manner in which we structure the cadre. So we have been struggling with structuring the cadre. And I think uh, this particular seminar today has given me a lot of inputs in the manner in which you can go around structuring the cadre. But structuring the cadre is one thing, and then getting in the resources to create the, uh, the manpower for structuring that cadre is very, very critical. Uh, and um, so you know, a dialogue on how do we go around structuring the cadre, uh, the the uh, uh, template that ha that has been shared by government of india how do we again customize it to actually respond to the challenges of public health and uh, much more importantly um, uh, if the gov uh, you know the focus as i said the allocation of resources in the public health because we have uh, minimal resources to spare the to bring the focus a lot more onto onto the public health aspect and of course, clinical, because we have a major burden, disease burden from uh, NCDs and CDs as well. Uh, Kerala being ecologically fragile and at a, you know, at a crossroads where we are very, very, uh, uh, very, very, uh, we have the threat of uh, communicable diseases and the threat of climate change is so high, which is something that we have recognized through and have put in place the One Health program. But, uh, uh, but also uh, the whole idea of uh, the partnerships that you're talking about. So, when we are talking about the indicators that we have achieved, have we achieved it on our own? Isn't it uh, as the, the various social determinants that have come in in terms of the various uh, you know, the, uh, inputs that have gone in over the decades together, which has resulted in this, uh, but also uh, a partnership with the private uh, uh, sector, which has uh, helped us, whether it is in maternal mortality or in uh, IMR. As, uh, just to give the case of IMR, you very specifically mentioned that our IMR uh, was uh, stagnant at 12 for a very long time. How did we get it down to six? Other than, of course, the various other aspects that we have gone in, in terms of addressing, uh, addressing the health of, uh, uh, of uh, the woman, over, uh, over a life cycle, uh, to, uh, to some extent, but also certain, uh, certain areas that we have uh, found out were contributing to uh, increased uh, infant mortality, like for instance the uh, CHDs and, uh, and the institution of the Hridayam program, which could not have been a success unless we had uh, partnered with the uh, private sector, where the expertise was, because we did not have adequate expertise and we are in the process of building up that expertise in the public sector. Uh, the, uh, this entire, uh, and Dr. Soumya mentioned, about uh, looking at uh, antenatal women and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and their issues uh, with the, you know, heart diseases. How do we ensure that? Uh, for, uh, recently, uh, we were looking at uh, wh why is there a high burden of, um, now the high burden of uh, uh, IMR is primarily due to premature births. How do you, what is the reason for premature births? How do you address, these are all public health issues. 
So these are issues that we need to address through our public health policy and through our public health uh, uh, programs. And uh, there are several public health programs, but in terms of ensuring the delivery of these public health programs, in terms of having the, uh, uh, sometimes it becomes very personalized. It's not, though the institutions are there, though the uh, systems are there, the systems as a whole may not be functioning well. And therefore, this whole focus on health system strengthening, on the whole system on empowering people at the grassroots to, uh, to be addressing the challenges of public health, to be addressing the challenges of right to health to, uh, uh, to our people at the grassroots is very, very important to, uh, to uh, skill them with the right capacities, build their capacities, to keep training and reorienting them uh, to address these challenges. I think these are the challenges that we are facing right now. And this is something that we really need to focus on to fill in the HR, as uh, uh, was rightly pointed out uh, uh, by uh, Madam just now. Uh, there are, we have positions that we are unable to fill in because of several reasons. Uh, and to uh, this investment in, uh, in uh, you know, HR in the public health cadre and, uh, of course, in providing curative services is something that we will need to be looking at in the long, long run. So that's Thank you. There is a presentation from Dr. Ashogan. Is it a recorded one? Please. Beloved, Beloved President of Trandra Medical Medical College, Alumni Association, Dr. John Panikar, Secretary Dr. Kavidara, it is a great privilege to be a part of this program and express the views of Indian Medical Association in addressing the challenges of Kerala Health. Many opinions might have been expressed here. The one point of view that Indian Medical Association like to forward. Strong public sector is the anchor of Kerala Health Board. Yet, there have been other players, especially in the private sector. There have been private doctors. There have been private doctors who have been running small hospitals, clinics, and there have been institutions which are related to the missionary aspect of the church also. And we have right now a situation which is totally different from what we have been enjoying in our earlier years. Now, we have a situation where no new clinics are appearing anywhere in Kerala as part of the independent practice of medical doctors. All the more so, no new small hospitals are being established in the state. For the past 25 years, we have lost around 1,000 small, medium and uh, hospitals as well as clinics, that it's going to be a crisis. The success of the Kerala model health care is an affordable care and an affordable quality care. This has been possible because of the neighborhood clinics and the neighborhood government institutions which are available. Here, the neighborhood clinics and the small and medium hospitals are disappearing. Or disappearing at an alarming, alarming rate. If we look at the statistics, we had 1950 hospitals in the state before 25 years. With, uh, private sector participation of around 68,000 beds. Today, we have less than 1,000 hospitals, but the private sector participation is equal to 68,000 beds. What it means is that small and medium hospitals are being replaced by for-profit big tertiary hospitals, which obviously the common man has an issue with both access as well as affordability. 
This is an important issue because this is the early stage. Often we find that Kerala walks first and then other states follow the trend later, much later. This may become an all India trend as well. But we need to find out a way to save this middle sector. This middle sector is important because this also provides for the independent practice of private doctors, which is an important entity. Most of them are family doctors. They provide a care which uh, sustains the Kerala health model. The confidentiality quotient is reinforced by the small and medium hospitals run by private doctors. So it's my case that there is uh, an urgent need to save this middle sector from collapsing. Whereas in 10 years ahead, we may face a situation. The choice narrows down to either a government setup or a for-profit setup. It will be a sad day if we lose the middle sector, which is currently being manned by the doctors of the medical profession. This is very important to anchor uh, not only the affordability question, but also the ethics of the healthcare industry will be retained by the medical profession. There are certain things like the clinical establishment act. In its current format, may cause disappearance of this middle sector much faster than what it otherwise would have been. So the government should start with reconsidering the Clinical Establishment Act of the Kerala state in the current format, make appropriate amendments so that it suits the middle sector. As a matter of fact, it will be good the government could consider that they will exempt the small and medium hospitals from the Clinical Establishment Act so that they will have an independent elbow room. It's not my case that these hospitals should not be regulated. There are already 53 legislations which govern the uh, practice of uh, medicine as a hospital or a clinic. And one more uh, very, very uh, stiff act can bring down the numbers of small and medium hospitals to an extent they will become extinct. So my, my perspective and the perspective of the Indian Medical Association is that Kerala health model should survive in the current format of public sector playing the lead role. Yes, tertiary care, cutting edge technology is required. But the middle sector, which is formed by the medical profession in the form of small and medium hospital, is replaceable, is not replaceable because they are the backbone, they are the family doctors, they practice medical profession with ethics and etiquette as defined in the Indian Medical Council Act. I hope I have made the point. I, I am grateful for the opportunity provided to me to express the viewpoint of Indian Medical Association on this topic. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, the Health Secretary, since the CM is very much interested in this public health cadre, especially he is very much impressed with the public health cadre in Tamil Nadu, we can find enough resources uh, in terms of uh, human and uh, financial resources to implement that. Well, let us hope that. Uh, yeah, let's hope for that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I'm sure we, uh, that can happen. Exactly. It's, uh, I think what we need to do is have this dialogue in how to structure it. Exactly. That's exactly. all. Uh, and and second, then implementation should not be an issue. Uh, ex uh, uh, and uh, your second point is very well taken. The, the whole issue of surveillance and monitoring. In fact, this is a failure at the global level also. In fact, I had for a book I was writing, listed out the uh, monitoring sur surveillance system at the global level, starting from CDC, CDC, WHO, large number of people. They failed. They, in spite of SARS in 2002, 2004, and uh, 2012-14, MERS, then Ebola came, Marburg disease, still the surveillance system failed. 
we were talking about one i said one health one world is no new concept at all it was already there and that is why we had to pay the price for this pandemic we could not close down the wet market in china so this happened so surveillance and monitoring is extremely important which is extremely weak even at the global level national level let us see at least in kerala we can show entirely different model now what dr ashokan was uh, referring to it in fact we had uh, given a when some of us were working on this the small and medium sized hospital issue a single doctor hospital so many of them are closing up. that is not not because of government problem issue at all it is not because of uh, the uh, the uh, the establishment act that they are getting you know, establishment act has not been implemented in kerala at all now i don't expect it to be implemented also i'm very sorry to say that i don't expect the uh, act to be established in kerala it is getting delayed that is not the reason why small and medium hospitals are closing down bigger hospitals have specialist hospitals have come and kerala people's perspective is going for specialist care etc etc but we have a project which we can discuss with you that let us network the government primary health care centers with the medium and small scale hospitals and then deliver a certain set of services to the public whether it is possible okay uh, uh, for one <laughs> on the clinical establishments act the standards have been published they were published uh, i mean uh, uh, about two days uh, two or three days back so i did not know <laughs> thank you <laughs> no but it has been delayed and it has been unfortunately for uh, whatever reasons have been delayed uh, with the court case and all uh, the standards have finally been published and uh, we will be pushing uh, through with the registration as you rightly said the cl- uh, shutting shop has nothing to do with the clinical yeah, establishment exactly. we have really Absolutely. not started implementing it but we intend uh, to uh, do it the reason we need to in, uh, uh, implement it uh, positively is because is essentially because of this reason, uh, uh, the you know the uh, from the public health perspective from the out of pocket expenditure that you talked of unfortunately in kerala we are still the uh, state with the highest out of pocket expenditure per capita and that we need to address and uh, and therefore it is a matter of access as you rightly said right and we are looking at uh, bringing in that access we are uh, actually taking down that access right up to uh the with the or with all these e sanjeevani that is the telemedicine concept and all uh which uh, i think dr uh, somia just mentioned in her uh, uh, her uh, you know address where she talked about this uh, example in orissa where they are actually connecting two specialists in uh, in uh, the tertiary level institutions or secondary level institutions so one is the access to consultation services uh strengthening of our sub centers the the uh, which uh, the cm is uh, going to be launching very soon as the jana arogya kendras the strengthening of the primary health centers which we did under the adram mission to ensure uh, and then of course uh, uh, our taluk level and uh, district level hospitals now how do we uh, as you said how do you network the primary health uh, setup to these middle level uh, uh, institutions is it possible at all is, uh, yeah. that that is the whole thing that we are trying to do uh, and we should discuss because this because the phc cannot cover all these correct purposes. we cannot yeah. we cannot so what is the referral pathway that we have and the back referral yes you know both and st- uh, standard treatment guidelines. and the sta- yeah. yeah so i think uh the one thing that has come out out of consultation with uh, across states nationally is the need to adhere to standard reference protocols it is very very critical because it uh, again you cannot have personalized treatment uh, i mean uh, 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 when i say personalized not uh, the patient dependent this becomes doctor advised so it cannot be that there are certain protocols that we have defined for us when you are looking at especially hypertension we are a state with a uh, with a huge burden of hypertension and diabetes and there, therefore the need for these uh, uh, innumerable uh, other uh, facilities uh, tertiary level facilities so uh, the point is uh, uh, we really need to adhere to standard treatment protocols we, uh, and then this entire system of referral and back referrals is something that we need to so the networking that you are talking about will happen once we have these protocols being adhered to and we know uh, we have this entire referral pathway or rather the uh, the networking pathway something which we are doing for labs also the hub and spoke model for the labs the uh, the state cancer control strategy talks about this entire you know stratified method of uh, screening and then uh, ref- uh, treatment and uh, i mean diagnosis and treatment and then back referrals 
So, this networking is critical because at the primary health level there are certain things that we cannot take care of. But can, that is the yeah. main critical core. Which we can we need further to work on this. But instead of uh, attacking, uh, the putting all blame on Clinical Establishment Act, which has ne never been implemented. Right. And moreover, we should not go on attacking acts. This is giving some amount of entitlements. Yes. Uh, some amount of standardization. We can modify it. So act per se, say Indian constitution, for example, it is an aspiration of the people and then from it emerges entitlement by forming an act. So therefore, I think we will now work on this. We can discuss with Dr. Shogan and other IMA members. And finally, uh, I have to say um, that there has been, we are in an over-congratulatory mode now. Because <laughs> Kerala, yes. uh, everybody is saying it is, uh, I, I am against this model business at all. I mean, I am against all comparisons also. Because we do not know about this, uh, the other, other countries, other states' uh, problems. And we say that uh, IMR is low, MMI. these are all good. These are good achievements. But the fact remains that if you change the indicators, I think we have to get out of the in conventional indicators. WHO has absolutely dropped this infant mortality, under five mortality, MMR business, because many countries and states are improving. Even Bangladesh is improving. A good example is Bangladesh. And instead, let us look at other parameters. Take, for example, Attapadi. I was there. Do you know the population of Attapadi? Only 30,000. Last so many years, pumping in so much money, and go there and see what is happening there. So therefore, you see, let us say how we treat our tribals, how we treat the uh, gender, how we manage the gender issues, women's health. Do you know that there is not even a good, clean toilet in Kerala for the women to go in a city? Am, am I not right? That is why they have to hold their urine, they develop current urinary tract infection, and all of them, most of them, develop incontinence of urine during their old age. But we did not have, we could not implement this simple project like establishing clean, because women will not go to unclean toilets, they will only go to clean toilets. So that is where we are standing. So therefore, while being proud of all our achievements, we should also understand our shortcomings. And one good thing, which I, I am very optimistic in one thing. During Chitra Govaran's time, and even after that, the public health cadre was not very attractive. This community medicine department. First of all, the textbook itself was so boring. The, uh, <laughs> I recently went to the library and tried to reread the part textbook of medicine. I think the railway guide can be read more enjoyable. So boring. So they, they did not go into the history of this pandemic, etc. Anyway, uh, in fact, if Chitra Gawal was alive, I would have requested her to write a textbook of community medicine. She would have written it better. But now things have changed. Now we have a very vibrant community health uh, experts in Kerala now. In fact, I do not want to. Our own director of medical education is a community medicine professor. So they are very active, very vocal. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, during the COVID period, these community medicine people actually helped Kerala to tide over the crisis, more than the clinicians. Because I was chairing the, uh, uh, I was chairing the expert committee. Dr. Rakel Gaidondai was sitting here. I think he has left. He was a professor of uh, uh, community medicine in Natural Medical Center. He was a member of the uh, expert committee. I learned a lot from him. Actually, I learned a lot publicly from. And therefore, I think that the torch which has been lit by Chitra Govaran is being carried over by the younger generation. So I am very optimistic because during her time or later, Kerala achieved all this health status because of public health intervention. And all the issues we are now facing can be and should be tackled by public health intervention. I am not belittling clinical side. I am myself, I am a clinician. But public health intervention is the crucial way by which we can tackle this crisis. Can I uh, use yeah. this opportunity since you have, um, you know, hit the nail uh, on the head? Uh, can I use this opportunity to request the community medicine departments of uh, the Department of Medical Education to, and especially, uh, uh, um, you know, at the uh, on the occasion of uh, the centenary celebrations of uh, uh, Dr. Chitra Gopalan, 
who, as Dr. Vijay Raghavan just so clearly said, she made it so interesting for them by actually taking them to the field, exposing them to the, uh, the realities in the field. Can I use this uh, forum now to request our medical education, uh, our departments of community medicine in medical education to move beyond, because there is a lot happening. And I know that we um, collaborate a lot on AMR and uh, all of that. Uh, and COVID, as uh, Dr. Uh, Egbal rightly pointed out, it was the community medicine uh, people who came forward and who managed. But we need to really get more involved in the community in the, in the sense that you really need to go to the field and uh, collaborate a lot more with uh, the health services. Madam, there's a family adoption program uh, according to the new CBME curriculum. So students are taken to the, uh, what to say, the field, and then they are encouraged to adopt families. And uh, throughout the five-year tenure, they follow them oh, up that's periodically. That's great. And see, yes. And also so that to is bring in a little more structure. Uh, one that is very structured and very good. That, uh, but also to look at. The public health, you know, uh, the emergencies that we deal with in terms of, uh, in terms of the entire surveillance of, for uh, CD and NCDs, in terms of the major challenges that we are lo looking at, it'll for them it becomes. Uh, it will, uh, not only does it strengthen their, uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, understanding and their learning for us, for the public health uh, systems, it is a huge boost in terms of have, having a larger group of people who are working and inputting into the system. So that is. Uh, Iqbal, sir, I, I, shall I make one? Hindu, sir. Ah, Hindu is here. In fact, I wanted to mention Sairu, Philip, Hindu, and all those friends. Oh, they were doing excellent work. In fact. And I used uh, actually, to consult a Hindu every other day during COVID. Uh, uh, madam, I work in Kollam. Uh, we, I mean, just now I was interacting my, with my students who okay, came, uh, joined the meeting. They are really, uh, I mean, the students uh, in the current generation, as uh, Kala Madam said, not only because of the, because the 2019 uh, MBBS curriculum revisions bring in the, uh, with the CBME, family adoption program. So each medical student is allotted uh, 10 families and they'll be following up, them up. So that is happening. Apart from that, uh, as, as uh, all of us were mentioning, surveillance, strengthening the uh, right now, I think Dr. Anuja, who was sharing the earlier session, actually, Trivandrum Medical College is a state PID cell, Prevention of Epidemic and Infectious Disease Cell. Each community medicine department, in collaboration with the microbiology, medicine, pediatrics, together report cases. So I think the, the big bulk of major diseases which get admitted syndromes, surveillance alerts, all that come from uh, the tertiary care hospital. So right now, there is a liaison, but of course, there is a lot of scope for uh, getting connected together and uh, involving especially the uh, undergraduates. I think uh, CBME uh, vice chancellor is also here, so that does that gives us a lot more opportunities for. Dr. Indu, yes, may I request you something, especially in the presence of the vice chancellor? Can you all come together and write a good textbook of community medicine, which can be. Uh, dedicated to Dr. Chitra Gowal. I am not joking because I was I went to the library before I came here. I was looking at the textbooks. I think community. I mean these textbooks which uh, are now currently. I hope you will agree with me. May not uh, excite our students. No, I request the vice chancellor to take an initiative to uh, write a community because Kerala can write it because we have all this experience of public health and we should publish it next year in memory of Dr. Chitra Gowari. I think the Chitra Gowari family will fund it, I am sure. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. I, I take the challenge. We will do that. We can do that. Thank you. <laughs> we, can, we can do that. Now, regarding uh, the uh, medical curriculum, the National Medical Commission has uh, made huge change in the medical curriculum. And also in the postgraduates, every postgraduate, doing in the medical colleges will have to go to the taluk hospital or district hospital for three months. Th that we have just started. So there is a connection 
has been established between the uh, medical colleges and the health service system, which was never there. So they learn in the medical colleges, and then they never ha uh, know what is happening in the uh, DC hospital, Sel hospital. Now this connection has been established. Now, if the uh, government also supports the uh, medical colleges and district hospitals and health system can be connected in various aspects, including research. So, for example, uh, health department has got amazing data with them, which is not, uh, I should say, not used. So, that, that not analyzed, not analyzed. And uh, uh, medical colleges have got a lot of faculty and the postgraduates, uh, they can uh, make use of it. Suppose we make uh, certain uh, ideas. So, we, uh, every year, uh, hundreds of students are doing thesis on various aspects. Suppose we have several problems. So, you enlist that problems and we will entrust the students to study such problem and with the available data. So, you suppose there is a good connectivity, connection between the health services and the medical education, then we can do wonders. Absolutely. It's, uh, it I would actually, actually intervene if I can for just a moment. Uh, I think the last speaker, what he said, is very interesting that, you know, can you hear me? Yes, madam. Yes, and that connectivity is a very uh, important uh, All the family block uh, listen, you know, in, in, in a two thousand five the report we had that we would have given for the PHC is is given to the medical college. So they man the PHC, they man the subcenters and they, they monitor all the diseases, preventive work, immunization everything through the uh, departments in the medical college. So you might like to consider that uh, suggestion because uh, the CMC, the outcome has been very, very positive. The secretary can have the last word. I'm going to I just respond to the same thing. Uh, district hospitals and taluk hospitals are one thing, one thing. But actually getting attached to uh, a PHC is a totally different thing. Because the happens over there and entire requirements of uh, uh, you uh, the health you you are just monitoring the health status of that block and that gives a very different perspective to the student as well so maybe that is something that uh, we should be thinking about this is a optimistic optimistic note don't forget mohan what you have promised Uh, let's uh, just one clarification yeah. regarding the message from uh, Dr. R. V. S. I think he never uh, uh, attacked the government sector or anything. What he said is, he, uh, he never said it is because of the government fault or anything. What he said is, right now there is a the number of the small and medium hospitals are going down, and there is a chance that after the clinical establishment bill in this form comes, it could be accelerated. That's what he said. And uh, he never asked to remove the whole bill also. It was ne never against the act. The only thing is some of the clauses may be reconsidered. That's what he mentioned. So. I understand that. In fact, there is an attempt to protect them by holding this networking of private and public sector. A new type of PPP. Yes. I say PPC would be a better term. So let us close down this discussion. Thank you very much. Yes. In fact, we are very optimistic about the future of community medicine because even up, we, it is already 6 o'clock, still people are waiting and hearing this. means that community health has got a bright future in Kerala. Thank you very much. So it was a very nice interaction. And uh, all the thanks to Iqbal sir and uh, all the, um, uh, the members of the uh, uh, this team. And especially to... Uh, Dr. Sujada Rao, she was there 
all the time from start to finish and also to uh, tingu bisal miss tingu bisal so may I request our uh, honorable chairperson moderator ikbal sir to present a memento to our uh, health secretary tingu bisal miss tingu bisal and uh, we will be sending a memento to sujada rao madam also yes 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 now i request dr ps taha to present a memento to our uh, moderator dr ikbal sir ps taha is annual uh, distinguished alumnus of trivandrum medical college and uh, he is the ceo of the pms dental college please sir and and request of yes our principal dr kalakesh went to present a memento to our vice chancellor dr k monan for being with us and uh, sharing his all this yes our principal is our patron of the alumni association and uh, she is leaving the medical college in 3 4 days and uh, we are saying farewell and uh, i am sure she will be always with the alumni association even after that and uh, we will meet uh, there there will be a retirement program after a few weeks okay ma'am thank you so shall we have a national anthem please stand up Oh, sorry before that we will have a what of time official what sorry <laughs> okay so uh, respected dignitaries on and off the dais so first of all uh, let me apologize for extending the program to beyond the schedule and uh, i am grateful to all those who stayed back until the end especially our highest officials our honorable honorable health secretary tinku piswal madam our vice chancellor dr mohanan sir and our principal kala keshavan madam so all the policy makers have been here and also uh, sujatha rao madam she was online throughout uh, from 4 uh, o'clock so i first thank all of them for being with us and uh, on behalf of the alumni association i would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to everyone who made this historic event possible i would like to begin by thanking g balagobal sir the brain behind this program who tirelessly worked for weeks to organize this tribute to his beloved mother thank you sir for giving us this opportunity to host this wonderful event thanks are due to sri mohan gopal sir and advocate divya balagobal too we are honored to have dr saumya swaminathan as our chief guest her presence alone was enough to draw in the audience and her oration was incredibly inspiring thank you ma'am for gracing us with your presence i would also like to extend our thanks to sujatha rao madam who joined us online and shared her experiences and thoughts your contribution was greatly appreciated special thanks to our esteemed alumnus dr mv pillar sir for his fantastic speech on one health which provided valuable insights and special thanks and uh, madam tinku biswal our health secretary has joined us for this seminar despite a busy schedule we extend our heartfelt gratitude to her and hope that the discussions and deliberations will be taken an, into account in future policy making we would also like to express our special thanks to dr rv ashokan the national president elect of the indian medical association for his valuable inputs as a secretary i must also acknowledge though our esteemed alumni 
the honorable vc dr mohanan kundamal sir and uh, dr e iqbal sir who moderated the session and of course dr s s lal too yes special thanks to dr vinay kumar sir also who is in fact a part of our team we would also like to extend our thanks to our director of medical education dr thomas matthew sir and our principal dr kalakeshwan madam for their unwavering support and guidance we are grateful to all the senior alumni present here and who were here before all the faculty from trivandrum medical college and the faculty and students from other medical colleges like gogulam medical college sut medical college kollam medical college pms dental college and also sri chitra tirunal institute of medical sciences and technology we would like to thank the entire organizing crew including the alumni and support staff for their hard work and dedication thank you all once again for making this event a grand success thank you and let's uh, rise for the national anthem पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा पिंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे